Um, thanks, broadcaster. I think Sam lost. I saw her on level one. Sorry, sorry, Chair. I declare open this hearing on of the Senate Environment and Communications References Committee inquiry into Australia Post. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and the land on which we meet and pay our respects to elders past and present. On behalf of the committee, I would welcome you all here today. Today, the committee will be conducting its hearing in person and via video conference. Thank you in advance for your patience with any technical issues we may experience along the way. For the benefit of all participants, I'm the chair, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and I'm joined in the room today by Senators Fawcett, Kitching, Mackenzie, Henderson, uh, by video conference from Senator Carr, and I believe Senator Hanson will be joining us at some stage. This is a public hearing and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing will also be broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated as the Senate by, uh, by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to be heard in private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken, and the committee will determine whether we insist on an answer having regard to the ground on which it is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request, of course, may be given at any other time. Those participating remotely are reminded to please state their name before uh, speaking to assist Hansard and also to mute the device when you do not have the call. I now welcome representatives from the Boston Consulting Group. Thanks for joining us today and uh, at short notice, we really do appreciate it. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could I get each of you to state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? We'll start from this end and work down. I'm Miguel Carrasco. I'm a Managing Director and Senior Partner with BCG. Thank you. Trish Clancy, Managing Director and Partner with BCG. Mark Waters, Managing Director and Partner with BCG. Thank you. Now, uh, I invite you to make an opening statement. I we have uh, one tabled. Would you like to go to that, uh, Ms Clancy, and then we can go to some questions? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, Senators, thank you for the opportunity to attend and to contribute to your inquiry. My name is Trish Clancy and I lead, led the BCG team that undertook the review of Australia Post. I'm here today with my colleagues Miguel Carrasco, who leads BCG's work with the Commonwealth Government, and Mark Waters, who heads our public sector practice in Australia. Can I say, first of all, we recognise that Australia Post plays a very, very important role in the lives of Australian communities, individuals and businesses, and we are committed to ensuring the long-term sustainability of Australia Post as a government business enterprise. BCG has always stated this, including in the review, and we would like to restate that again for the Senate today. BCG has supported our clients in the public sector for many years under both Labour and coalition governments. In November 2019, the Commonwealth, through the shareholder departments of Australia Post, engaged BCG through a competitive tender process to undertake an independent strategic review. The review was publicly announced by the Minister for Communications and concluded in February 2020, prior to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic or any knowledge of what effects it might have. The report that BCG produced through this review is the property of the shareholder departments we understand remains subject to a public interest immunity claim. We are therefore only able to discuss today the executive summary that is already on the public record. As we noted in that summary, the departments in Australia Post were aligned on a commitment to ensuring the business's ongoing, sustainable, self-funded delivery of relevant services to the Australian community. BCG's report looked at the overall economics of the business, the trajectory of letters volumes, potential growth in parcels, e-commerce, retail and financial services, competitive dynamics in Australia Post's core markets, and more. <clears throat> Excuse me. We drew on the knowledge of our extensive network of local and global subject matter experts. We laid out detailed analysis of many aspects of the business. We canvassed a wide range of ideas and options for growth and efficiency and the related implications. We developed four potential reform paths, including some that we did not recommend. 
We did this so that the Commonwealth and Australia Post would have the analysis to consider, should they choose to, in their ongoing efforts to strengthen the business. Our report did express a view on some specific actions. These included that the Commonwealth and Australia Post should continue to invest in growing the parcels business to support e-commerce growth, continue to invest in additional services and revenue growth, including growing financial, identity and other in-person services, maintain the size of the licensed post office network and arrangements with its licensees, Maintain, regulate, maintain the size of the post office network in all regional and remote communities. Maintain regulated post office service levels in metropolitan areas, but within that consider closing only loss-making corporate post office outlets that overlapped with other post offices, which would also improve the viability of licensed post offices in those areas. Maintain a level of service for the letters business that is fit for purpose, and begin a multi-year process to consider reforms that could assist the loss-making letters business, though we did not specify what those should be. Make some head office and other cost reductions that would not impact service levels. Importantly, and for the avoidance of doubt, BCG did not recommend the privatisation of Australia Post as a whole, nor of its letters, parcels, nor retail businesses. BCG did not recommend the closure of any licensed post offices, nor changes to Australia Post arrangements with its licensees. BCG did not recommend the closure of any post offices in regional and remote Australia. Our review was broad in its focus and did not start with any preconceived answers in mind, and we were not directed to explore or reach any predetermined conclusions. We analysed and modelled the data we were provided by Australia Post, together with market data, department data and international experience. We extensively explored growth opportunities, including expansion of existing and new products and services, including financial services, and including in regional and remote communities across Australia. We also quantified potential cost efficiency opportunities, without saying how resources should be redeployed, as well as quantifying a range of potential regulatory reforms seen internationally. All of our work had the purpose that the Commonwealth and Australia Post might have a wide range of analysis to consider to ensure a balanced path to long-term sustainability for Australia Post as a government business enterprise. The BCG team received significant input from Australia Post executives, including the CEO, the executive leadership team and operational leaders within Australia Post. BCG also received input from the Departments of Finance and Infrastructure. Input took the form of workshops, conversations, data and working sessions. As I said earlier, BCG also analysed data and commercially confidential information provided formally by Australia Post through the process. The BCG team met with Australia Post chairman once on the 4th of February 2020 and presented to the Board of Directors once on the 20th of February 2020. All feedback was considered by the BCG review team, but the report remains the product of an independent review by the BCG team. As I said at the start, Australia Post, Post plays a very, very important role in the lives of all Australian communities, individuals and businesses. BCG always has, has always been and remains deeply committed to supporting the long-term sustainability of Australia Post as a government business enterprise, so that it may continue to play this important role in the future. Thank you, and we welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Clancy. Um, your, uh, and you've given us your uh, opening statement, so we'll, um, we'll have that tabled. Um, you've said uh, that BCG did not recommend the privatisation of Australia Post as a whole nor its letters, parcels or retail operations. Um, how do you marry that with the uh, proposals in your pathway options for divestiture? We, as part of our review of the long-term sustainability of Australia Post, we did not recommend, I would like to reiterate, privatisation of Australia Post as a whole, nor its parcels, letters, nor retail operations. 
We did suggest that it may be worth the government looking at some of the sub-businesses within Australia Post and doing a detailed study of whether they are still relevant to core operations. And what types of sub-businesses would they be? There were two that were mentioned in the executive summary. Um, Star Trek Road Express, I will need to take the name on this. Yes, That's Star the Trek correct Road name. Um, and Secure Pay. Uh, Star Trek Express, they do parcels, don't they? They are, are, they are part of the parcels business, but they are a subsidiary within it, is my understanding. Oh, so this is a matter of semantics for you then? No, we did not. No, it is not, Senator. So you did propose options for the privatisation of some of the sub-sections of Australia Post? We did not propose privatisation of subsections of Australia Post. We suggest that it, there may be value in reviewing some of the sub-businesses within Australia Post. Reviewing for what purpose? To see if their alignment with the core remains. Whether they can be sold off? Whether they could continue to provide value as, as a, a part of the core business in alignment with uh, Australia Post's core purpose. Yeah. Sounds like selling off part of Australia Post to anyone listening. We did not recommend the privatisation of any part of Australia Post. <laughs> One man's divestiture is another's privatisation. Yes, I, I, I think no, that's... Oh, Senator Henderson. Too soon. Uh, OK. Can I, I just ask, there was a... We were told and informed by the board last week um, that there was a task force uh, that was, es was established or a, a working group uh, that you worked with on this report. Uh, who was on that? We, w we worked with a working group of... Um, so we met on a, on a regular basis with a group of uh, officials from Australia Post, uh, from the Departments of Finance and Communications. I'll have to take on notice the specific names, but I'm happy to provide them to the committee. Mm -hmm. And you said you met with the, the chairman of Australia Post once prior to the meeting with the full board. That is correct. And so that was on the 4th of February. Yes. Um, was there any changes to the report between uh, from the, when you met him on the 4th and then when you had the full board meeting on the 20th of February? I do not recall any specific changes in that time. The nature of our work is we don't do the final report till we're finishing and therefore it would have been continued to have been written during that time. Uh, I will go to uh, Senator Carr. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Look, uh, if I, Ms, uh, Ms Clancy, I'm wondering how your statement that uh, you didn't recommend uh, changes, and I might say the chairman has advised us that there were no recommendations <laughs> in your report, and I, I do note on page 10 you the word recommendation does appear several times, but I'm wondering how your statement to us fits with the summary that you actually provided the board on the 20th, was it the 20th of February, but that, was there a three hour meeting, you gave a one and a half hour presentation, can you confirm that? You we, did give a one and a half hour presentation? We gave 20th? a presentation to the board on the 20th of February, it was of approximately one and a half hours. Thank you. Now, in that presentation, your summary says that you wanted to you give material risk and financial challenges of facing Australia Post. BCG believes it's prudent for the government of Australia Post to undertake a more fundamental sequentious reform to Australia Post regulatory environment operations. These include reducing letter service standards, frequency and or speed, to drive a sustainable 20 to 30 per cent reduction in letters cost base, the streamlining a metropolitan CPO network by closing at least 106 unprofitable outlets while maintaining access for metropolitan households for at least one post office within two and a half kilometres. And I quote, exploring the potential for divestiture of parcels, while noting that this would leave a loss-making core business without meaningful reforms to letters. How does that gel with your statement to the Senate? Yeah. Senator, I, I'm afraid I do not have that document in front of me and therefore it is difficult to, to um, I, answer I'm, I'm to. Not, 
Sorry. Okay, well, I'll put it to you this way. Did you recommend the board at that one and a half hour meeting for the potential for the divestiture of parcels? Sorry. Sorry, Senator, Senator Carr, just for clarity, what are you quoting from? What document are you quoting I'm from? The can, hang on a second. Just hang on a second, please, Senator Henderson. I really, can we try and have a li bit more decorum than last time? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm quoting from the executive summary, Boston Consulting Group's executive summary. Okay, thank you. Well, We've, if Ms Clancy doesn't have it in front of her, so she can't answer Senator Carr's question, given the rest of us have it in front of us, maybe we could provide Ms Clancy a copy of her own executive summary. Yes, that would be interesting, but I'm asking the direct question, Ms Clancy, did you recommend to the board exploring the potential for the divestiture of parcels, quote unquote, which was on the 20 February 2020, as contained in your summary? Thank you very much for the question. I now have the document uh, that I think you're looking at in front of you. The document I have in front of you was used as a working paper at a meeting, not a board meeting, at a meeting on, I think it was the 18th of December. Uh, the recommendations are contained in the word report that has been shared uh, by the former C by, by Ms. Holgate. Um, the, we did not recommend the, di the privatisation or divestiture of parcels in our final report. All right. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Clancy. We've been advised the Australia Post review was dated the 20th of February. I want you to. I would like you to check your records because I'm advised that that document was provided on the 20th That's of February, 2020, the day before the final report was now issued. To the board. And I. I'd ask you again, how did that fit with your statement that you did not recommend exploring the potential for the divestiture of parcels when it's stated in your own overhead uh, presentation? What I have in front of me, I believe, was, was used in December, not in February. Mm -hmm. Well, and at that a, time, and between December and yeah, February, sorry. we did okay. additional analysis that led us mm -hmm. to our conclusion that Australia Post should not privatise its parcels business. Well, I've got here a copy also of the statement that was issued by the CEO in her supplementary submission, which clearly lists the options that are put before us as pathways. Uh, as you uh, describe them, divestiture is there included in options four, options three, option two, options one, on page 20 of that executive summary. Perhaps you could explain to me, have I misunderstood what those words mean? Senator Carr. I am now referring to the word report dated the 21st of February. The uh, potential for divestiture is to look at potential divestiture of some sub businesses is included in options two and three. Mm. Um, my apologies and if four. I confused the house earlier. And four. Um, and four. Option, it is included in option four. We explicitly did not recommend that government implements option four. I see. So when you put this position as to the closure of 106 post offices, what you repudiate that as well? We we do recommend we recommend as part of our review of the long term sustainability of Australia Post, we do not recommend the closure of any licensed post offices. We do not recommend no, no, the closure I, of any corporate post offices yeah. in regional and remote Australia. Within no, metro no, areas no, within no, metro no, areas, we do recommend the closure of a number of unprofitable corporate post offices that are above the service requirements so that the license, so with the closure of 106 or 190, depending on which option was chosen, this would maintain service levels within current, uh, the current regulations. It would also allow more revenue for viability of the licensed post offices in these areas. So I'd be clear, you're recommending between 106 and 190 closures of Australia Post's post office. 
Corporate post, loss making corporate post offices in metro areas. You, you may well describe them in many ways. I want to be clear about the numbers 106 yes. to 190 post office closures. That is correct, 106 to 190 corporate loss making corporate post offices in metro areas with the retention of all regional and remote post offices and all licensed post offices. Uh, Senator Carr, How many job would that involve? If I actually, can I How many job loss, Clancy, would that involve? Sorry, Senator Carr, I was just wondering if I could uh, clarify one thing. And again, I refer back to the executive summary that's in the public domain. What we recommended was that Australia Post consider at least the actions outlined in Reform Path 1, which includes 106 corporate post offices in metro Mr. areas no, okay. that are unprofitable. Thank you very much. I, I, now, I've asked, we've already had that information. What I'd like to know is, on your estimates, the closure of between 106 and 190 post offices, how many job losses would that involve? That would involve the reduction of between 590 and 1,045 roles. We expect that, depending on how this was carried out, many of these people could be redeployed into other growth areas within Australia Post. Thank you. And in terms of the <coughs> service delivery reductions, would that not require legislative change? It would not require legislative change for either of those. Senator Carr, we, we will you. have to go to other uh, questioners. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your attendance today. Um, Senator Carr has already uh, traversed a lot of the issues I wanted to go to, and I will be putting a range of um, questions on notice around um, people that worked on the BCG report who may have been political staffers uh, in previous roles uh, it's, and the other work that BCG undertakes for government. Um, so just they're coming your way. I'm really interested in... Um, you say incumbent banks are expected to retreat further from regional and remote areas in Australia, um, and the role that Ms Holgate's $220 million deal with Bankat Post uh, had on the financial sustainability of rural and regional post offices. Um, you see in this report with potentially 35 per cent fewer branches and half as many ATMs as in uh, 2030. Did, do you see the renegotiation then of the Bank at Post deal uh, essential to maintaining the financial viability for rural and regional licensed post office holders? Uh, Senator, I think when we looked at all the growth opportunities that were available um, to Australia Post, financial services is clearly one um, that will play a significant part. Um, the um, uh, we didn't see, um, uh, you know, we saw, we saw that, that that would continue to remain an opportunity and that they should continue to invest in that business, um, uh, particularly in regional, rural and remote areas. When you talk about um, issues that are subsets, not uh, core business for Australia Post, how did you define, how did BCG define core business for this review? I will just quote from our executive summary, if I may. Um, the statutory obligations of Australia Post, as we understand them, are to provide a universal service, letter service that's reasonably accessible by all Australians, to operate in a manner consistent with sound commercial practice, to provide a financial return to its shareholders. Okay, so um, maybe drafted in 1901. Um, is that, uh, in your view, having looked internationally, um, fit core services for uh, government-owned postal operation in the 21st century, particularly given the growth of e-commerce? That is our review into the long-term financial sustainability of Australia Post didn't look into whether it, it comparisons with the expectations of other postal services. So I'm not in a position to answer that question. But you said you looked internationally at, at comparisons around reform. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming other um, nations haven't kept their royal mail uh, in 1901 standards? What we did not look at was the expectation of, uh, of delivery in other countries. We looked at how delivery happened, etc. Um, February last year, COVID-19, COVID arrives. Um, would, what would you change <coughs> in your executive summary? Would, would any, any of your 
not recommendations, but suggestions, shall we say, to the Australia Post uh, Board for reform change? I think the, the world has changed for all of us um, in, in the last year, and we would want to redo the analysis in a more thorough, in a thorough manner to provide recommendations that are uh, cognizant with where the world is at today. But you're not going to get to do that, are you? I don't expect so. They've employed Taxpayer me. would have to fund it all over again, I'd suggest. Well, I was going to go to that. Um, how? Um, what was the original quote you provided to complete the full review to, your share, to the shareholder ministers? Uh, the quote was 1.38 million, I believe. Um, so there was no additional um, requests for funds throughout the review? Through the period of November 2019 to February 2020, there were no additional requests for funds. It was throughout, a price. So when did you sign the contract to do the review? I will have to take that on notice. It was, was it before November, the date was, you just gave me? It was before we commenced the work. It would yep. have been very close to that date, is my expectation. I will take it on notice. So following signing of the contract for $1.3 million, there was no request for additional funding by BCG to complete the review? That is correct, through to February 2020. Well, yes, what to complete the review. No, no. Let's, let's not be yeah. like, yeah, you know, the because then no. senators yeah. get very worried that there's something cute existing no, outside no. of those days. There was no additional request. No. So you did not seek additional payments at all? No. no. Okay. Um, and the terms of reference didn't change throughout the review? No, they did not change. Um, I'm going to keep mine on notice and give time to other senators. Thank, Thank you. you. Could I just uh, follow up on um, the contract? Do, were you aware at the time that, that, that your work would be kept secret and away from the eyes of the Australian people? We were aware that we were producing a product for government and it was government's decision what it would do with the product. But was there's it, nothing the public should be afraid of the government in your review, is there? It's quite common for our work to be given to government and then for government to decide what it does with it. Are you surprised they've kept it secret? That's not an answer to my question, Ms Clancy. I'm sorry? That's not an answer to my question. I know it's common for government to commission reviews that they then choose not to release. My question to you was, there is nothing in this review that should the public should, be, uh, should not be in the public domain. There's nothing people should be afraid of. Uh, I, th I think, Senators, as you would know, there's been a public interest immunity claim on the report. We're not and asking one of you the to speak to well, government, you're not, a, you're, not a, you're not a government minister. No, no and I'm not <laughs> claiming that. Uh, Good. <laughs> but uh, in that claim, uh, it notes that there is significant commercial sen commercially sensitive information about the economics of Australia Post, which is the reason for it, which in the hands of competitors could be a significant advantage. And so there's, I think, a reasonableness to why the report in, in its entirety is not public. It, it's very sensitive commercial information. Uh, all the competitors to deliver all the letters. <laughs> Parcels in particular. I'm sure that would be, you know, of much use that to some of Australia Post's competitors. Not, the, the board has made very clear to this committee, as you will have seen in uh, evidence uh, last week, that they're not interested in divesting of any part of Australia Post. Okay. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, did you discuss with the government a public version of the report that could be released? I do not remember any discussions of this nature. At what point were you told that the report would be kept secret? I do not remember being told that the report would be kept secret. So when you wrote this report, did you understand that it would be kept secret or did you think that it would be made public? Surely that makes a difference to how the report is, conduct how the report is presented. It doesn't make a difference from the perspective of the analysis we do, the drafting we do, etc. And so it wasn't a question that we asked or an answer that was given to us. Will McKinsey get a copy of your review? I have no idea of government. I, I, I'm not in a position to answer for, for the shareholder departments. Okay. Um, out of the 1.38 million that it costs uh, to that that it costs the taxpayer for this report, um, 
How long did it take you to do? We worked on the report from early November to the end of February. Mm. And do you have accumulated hours that uh, you've, your organisations put into it? I do not have that to hand. Could you take that on notice, please? Yes, I can. Um, and I'd like to know, what was the profit made on this report of $1.38 million? Uh, look, Senator, we, we're not necessarily, um, uh, you know, th this was a, a fixed fee arrangement, um, you know, for a fixed uh, outcome or agreed set of deliverables. Mm -hmm. um, fixed outcome. Well, it, a, an agreed set of deliverables and scope and terms of reference, um, and that's the basis of most of our engagements with, with I, government. I, I understand that. But you, you didn't do this out of charity. You were contracted to do this. It's your business. You make a profit on this. I'd like to know what the pro you can take it on notice, but I'd like to know what the profit margin on this report has been to your organisation. Did you have to tender for this project? Yes, we did. Yes. We tendered through a competitive process. Okay. So, yes, it appears on last tender. Okay. And, um, just while we're there, while you're looking for documents, did you receive any emails from? the government ministers in relation to, you know, whether it would be remaining confidential or not? Could you have a look for any email, any correspondence? We can do. See? Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Senator Henderson. <clears throat> and then we'll come to you, Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. I wanted to just ask you to begin with, is there any scenario recommended or not in which BCG recommended cutting services in regional and remote Australia? No. We, we, throughout the report and looking at the long-term financial sustainability of Australia Post, we recommended maintaining services in regional and remote Australia and continuing to invest in many of the services that regional and remote Australia, I guess, benefit from, like financial services. The, the, the Labor Party has been on a scare campaign about the, the so-called privatisation of Australia Post, as well as job losses and post office closure claims. And I want to refer to the 13th of April hearing, Senator Carr said the BCG review would have seen implemented massive job cuts, maybe as many as 8,000 in one of the scenarios here. The closure of 190 suburban post offices, massive reductions in service delivery standards, and a fundamental shift in community service obligations. Um, now, I understand that that refers to reform path four, where <coughs> it was made clear this was absolutely not recommended. So um, can I just first of all get you to clarify that and also ask you in your view, has Labor uh, and the unions willfully represented and politicised your report? Uh, to answer the first part of your question, uh, that I believe does refer to Reform Path 4, which we clear clearly state in the word executive summary that we do not recommend government implements. So Senator Carr's claim, uh, maybe as many as 8,000 job cuts, uh, is based on a scenario that you absolutely explicitly recommended, um, did not recommend in any way. That is correct. Um, sorry, sorry, Chair, I do have the I do have that the call. Still sorry, places like Geelong and Tweed Heads, doesn't it? As, as sorry, sorry, Chair, I do have the call, and I would you do, like you do have the thank, call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Um, did, did you meet with Ms Holgate and her executive team for the purposes of preparing this report? Yes, we did. Um, did Ms Holgate provide any feedback about the issues discussed in your report? We had, uh, we had feedback from Australia Post as a whole and we had discussions with uh, the CEO and her leadership team on a number of occasions throughout the preparation of the report. And was Ms Holgate and her, and her executive team's feedback used to shape the final version of your report? Feedback from all the stakeholders was used to test our analysis, the quality of the assumptions, etc., and therefore uh, fed into the report. Although the report is an independent report by BCG and it was not um, beholden to any particular stakeholder. Mm. And did you discuss privatising Australia Post with Ms Holgate at any point in time? The option uh, reform pathway four would have been um, shared with uh, the CEO along with other share other stakeholders. So can you just <coughs> clarify your answer there? Um, so reform path. Um, 
I do not remember any specific discussions with Ms Holgate on privatisation of Australia Post in part. But you had the discussion with Ms Holgate and her team and, 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 and she was fully aware of, of the, the options that you were canvassing? The, uh, the CEO and her leadership team were aware of the options, yes. Um, look, obviously Ms Holgate has, has shared with the committee the executive summary of, of your report. Um, can you can you just make it very clear? Do, do any of the pathways, except, except pathway reform number four, suggest privatisation of Australia Post? No. What about pathways? Do, 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 sorry, Chair. Do, do well, any I'd, of the pathways? I'd like a clarification on that because it's different evidence to what. No, Ms. but Clancy I haven't gave finished. The I just want to clarify this with, with a follow-up question. You did ask this question. Yes, but do any of the pathways suggest divestment of parts of the Australia mm -hmm. Post business? Yes. Uh, one, two, and three. Yes. What does it say under one, two, and three? Under Sorry, four, um, Chair, could I, we just allow okay, the witness so, uh, to answer the question. Order, Senator Henderson. She is getting to the point. I think Senator Carr. Senator Henderson. Pathways one, two, and three all have the potential for targeted divesture. Privatisation. Um, targeted divestiture, mm -hmm. and what? And what's the difference between that and privatisation? In, we were in, within this scenario, we were suggesting that government looks at some of the non-core businesses to see if they were still relevant to <coughs> Australia Post's future, you, financial um, future. Did you discuss alternate day mail delivery with Ms Holgate or any members of her executive team? We, we discussed all the reform pathways with the CEO and her executive team, which would have included uh, alternative day delivery. And I, I just want to go back to my question. What do you say to... Um, the representation in relation to the 8,000 job cuts, which is obviously reform pathway number four, which you clearly did not recommend. Um, in your view, have Labor and the unions willfully attempted to misrepresent your report? Do you want uh, look, I don't think it was really for us to comment how others might be wanting to use our report. Um, I think what we, um, what you will see in the public domain is the executive summary and the information that is the result of the rigorous analysis that we did um, to consider a wide range of options. And in, as it relates to potential divestitures, it does say potential divestitures. We were very clear that we didn't do the work that would be required in order to make a decision about any of those. Further scoping studies and detailed work would need to be undertaken to work out whether they are core or non-core, what the value of those assets might be, etc., and so on. And our recommendation was limited to only pursuing the activities related to Reform Path 1 to begin with. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Nofer. Thank questions. you, Senator Henderson. Senator Hanson has the call. Thank you very much. Um, Mr um, Carrasco, is that how you say it? Mr Waters, um, were you both in involved in the review? Yes, I was the chair of the expert panel. You were actually involved in the review. How long have you been with the organisation, BCG? I've been with BCG since the year 2000. Right. Um, I'm led to believe that, Ms Clancy, you're the only one that was actually involved in the review. All three of us were involved in the review. I led the review. Right. Um, the executive summary here, and as you're saying, you had no intentions of actually... Your report states part one, two, three and four. You state you had no intention of actually implementing platform uh, reform path four. In your executive summary, it says Australia's post-metro footprint has a high degree of unprofitability and geographical overlap and significantly exceeds regulated numbers. That appear, there appears to be a clear rationale for streamlining that it, for example, closing the 114 metro CPOs that are unprofitable and have 100% catchment overlap with more viable outlets and using um, smaller footprints to reduce costs, example lockers and counters. Um, when you speak about closure of post offices, a lot of them you can't because they're privately owned, aren't they? We did not recommend closure of any licensed post offices, so any privately because owned you can't. post offices. Because they're privately owned. Yes. You can't close them. Under your report also here, if you go to at the back, under okay. report here, 
So the ones that we suggested be looked at are all corporate post offices. So the ones you can close. You are. Yes. And that's about 26 per cent, isn't it? I would need to take that on notice. So how many well, would you close if you could close them all? The that's the question Senator Hanson's getting to. Our analysis shows. You're looking at corporate post offices, which is about approximately about 26 per cent you were looking at. I will state it. Under here, in your report also, you state that if the shareholder departments seek material improvements in financial sustainability, BCG believes that this is offered by reform paths two and three while noting their great Im impacts on stakeholders, including the workforce. It is BCG's view that the preferred path should be set in motion as soon as possible, given the risk of imminent losses and the long lead times for changes of this nature. So you know that what you're proposing is going to affect the workforce, Australia's workforce. I'll go to this here. You know, you're predicting here your assessments, path one, two and three reforms, and you're talking about your letter delivery. And in your reform of two and three, you're reducing the three days per week for suburban metro boxes, um, PO boxes daily. That would be a saving of 78 million. The alternate weekdays, post office boxes only, was another saving of 177 million. But if we go to path four, you've got two days per week, which are in your recommendations. They're still your recommendations that put before the government, would be two days a week of saving $237 million. Right along, you say, to get rid of priority mail, which would be a saving of $19 million. And what you're saying here is the cost of reform, redundancies, a one-off, is going to be $680 million in a one-off cost. So your recommendations was to actually um, reduce the workforce. That's what it's a saving that you've put to the government and closing corporate post offices. What I want to ask you, was this prior to um, did the, how did the, the chair and the directors of the board interact with you and what they foresaw should happen, what they you know, could see should be happening to Australia Post? Did they have any vision for the future? Well, they just said, go and do this report. How are we going to cut losses? We were, uh, we were tasked by the, the shareholder departments, not the board, um, okay. We did present to the board. We met the chair in, in February, and we presented to the board in February last year. He couldn't remember that actually. The first meeting, he just flicked through the pages. He had no idea that they had a board meeting. But it's quite interesting that you've actually confirmed that, and later on he did confirm it. But you've had a full board meeting. You explained to them. Under your, please go on. Sorry. Um, in in the board meeting, the board members asked a range of questions to understand our analysis, the options, the assumptions between beneath each, etc. Right. Did you at any time look at what costs had been going on within Australia Post itself? Did you look at the cost of the executives? Did you look at the cost of under the former CEO, a mad for her, what he cost the organisation? Rather than looking at getting rid of the workforce, rather than closing our corporate post offices, did you look at, were you tasked with looking at the internal cost of the organisation, the waste of money that was going on there? We reviewed Australia Post's operations um, in a broad sense as part of our review. Good. So then you did look at the remuneration payout to, to all the executives and everyone, did you? I will need to take that on notice. Well, you want, you, uh, no, sorry, you were involved in the whole three of you were involved in it. You should be able to tell me directly, did you look at the cost of the organisation, what they paid out in remunerations? You must be able to tell me that, surely. Any bonuses? We looked at the cost base of Australia Post broadly, the costs in various elements, in letters, in corporate, in parcels, etc. I do not have details of very specific levels of expenditure. <clears throat> so you never looked at what the remuneration they get. Like some of the executives were getting $669,000 in remuneration, in incentive payments. You never looked at that all, at all. I'm happy to take it on notice, Senator. I think that's a pathetic answer. 
Thank you. How long were you involved in this, this review for? Four so months. If they have said that they would take the answer on notice. I'm sorry, I'm, Chair. I've said it. And I'm not withdrawing it. Well, I'm not saying to withdraw it. I'm just, I'm just Senator Hen on. Henderson, I'm just asking, asking here. not to reflect How on witnesses. How long were you please. involved in the review for? How long were you involved in it? Are you going to interrupt everyone today? Like just let's, let's just order. Have a crack at me. Order. Oh, Senator Hanson, this is your final question. Ms Clancy, how long were you involved and your two colleagues in the review for? How long did it take? The review started in November 2019 and completed in February 2020. Oh, four, four months. Four months. Were you given a um, direction by the minister? Have you um, got a direction what you were supposed to look at? Uh, our terms of reference were given to us as part of the tender process. Minister, the Minister for Communications announced the scope of the review uh, uh, around the time we started as well. Okay. Uh, can you have a follow-up? Um, well, I have a question. Um, while you were giving evidence to other committee members, I did look up divestiture and it says the action or process of selling off subsidiary business interests or investments. The example it gives is the divestiture of state-owned assets. Oh, sounds like privatisation. And then we come to the Investopedia, a very sort of generic um, definition. In finance, divestment or divestiture is defined as disposing of an asset through sale, exchange or closure. However, there are many reasons why companies engage in divestitures and not all of them have a positive impact on the company. So when you were discussing that with the shareholder minister, was there any, I mean, you can give different recommendations, but it's not up to you, even though you say, look, we really don't recommend you do option four. It's up to them really to take your advice and to do with it as they will. That's what they're paying for. They're paying for your advice. So did you have any understanding from meetings with shareholder ministers that they were going to ignore your rec recommendation? Um, um, we went with the Minister for Communications. He asked a range of questions about the analysis, the underpinning assumptions, etc. He did not express a preference for any of the options, mm, nor sure. a preference for no option. Now, can I go to your state, your opening statement, where you do talk about a public interest immunity claim? And what I'm interested in there is when I look to, you know, the common law. I mean, it is common law of the, you know, public interest immunity. Mm. Um, you know, why, why did you, Ms. Clancy? Why do you think that that they claimed that? I, I'm not in a position to, to understand why other people would have claim, claimed something or not. Because, I mean, sometimes you claim a public interest immunity, and I'll, list, I'll go through a list. For potential criminal offences, do you think it was for that? Ms Clancy? Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, do you think a public interest immunity claim was made because there were potential criminal offences? I couldn't. I don't think it's really our role to speculate on why okay, let me it was read. made. Do you it's think really it was, a question for the government. Do you think it was law enforcement? Do you think it was national security defence or international relations? That's another ground. Do you think it was potentially prejudicing the proper functioning of government? Do you think it was that ground? Yeah, the witness has already asked, All right. asked yeah, this and, question. And, the, and Senator Kitching has well, a right to ask a follow-up question. That is what she's doing, Senator Henderson. Well, so just. Yes, there is no yeah, point of order. There. there is no point of order. I'm not yeah, calling a point of okay. order. So I'm Senator just Kitching, suggesting that this is your last question. This is your last, question. Yeah, and, your last question. And thank you, Mr. Carrasco, for responding. I am interested, and I'm happy for you to take it on notice. For the grounds that I've mentioned, um, do you was there any were any of these grounds raised? Um, do you f and did you think that there was going to be when the public interest immunity claim was made by the government? Were you surprised? Senator, we were not in any way involved in but no, the deliberations or decisions I'm not by the asking government you to that. make I'm the asking claim. whether you were surprised that your report was subject <coughs> to, an, to an immunity claim. I, as I said, I can't speculate on the rationale or the reason speculate. why they were made the claim. Were you surprised? I, look, I'd refer back to my earlier answer, I think, in Ms. that- Ms Clancy? I think my colleague was answering for us. Mr Waters? Indeed. 
<laughs> oh, so good. Oh, we're all in sync there. All in sync. Uh, Senator McKenzie, a final follow-up, and then we have to go to our next lot of witnesses, please. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Given on, just hang on, I, a case point of order. I'm sorry, I do not. I think all witnesses have got to be treated with respect. There was a clear reflection by your comments and Senator Kim, um, Kitching's comments on the on the on the witnesses here saying, "Oh yes, well they were all in sync." I think all witnesses need to be treated with appropriate respect, and I'm sorry. That is a very important principle of well, all committees. Point taken, Senator Thank Henderson, you. and I look forward to you behaving the same way. Thank Senator you. Thank you very much, I'm Chair. It sometimes depends on the witness. Um, I just going back to um, our earlier questioning about core business of Australia Post. Given that e-commerce has increased over 57 per cent over COVID, and that even in your own report you talk about the increase propensity for this um, going forward for the mail service as a, as a growth area. Was there ever any discussion that core business for Australia Post should be extended beyond a letter service, aka Cobb & Co 1901? Was there any uh, discussion from shareholder ministers, from any stakeholders that you spoke to of actually one of the reform suggestion should be guaranteeing Australians a parcel service, a regular parcel service from their postal um, organisation, of extending the, their core business. Uh, over the course of, the, I do not remember. Sorry, <laughs> I do not recall conversations of that nature. We obviously discussed parcels as an intrinsic part of Australia Post operations. Mr. Crusoe. Were you going to add something? I, I'm happy to add uh, to my colleague's response. Um, and I refer back again to the executive summary, which says that in order to achieve the sustainability of the organisation, given the um, structural economics and of a loss-making letters business, you need other more profitable operations to offset that. Um, that's why the parcels business is a critical part of the future, and we did not recommend privatising it. No, so Thank it you. should become <coughs> core business for Australia Post. It's essential for them to be able to meet that objective of sustainability, yes. Fantastic. And, and um, did you, uh, in this uh, effort, review the Australia Post board policies on gifts and remuneration? We did not. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Senator Fawcett has, he promises me, two very quick questions. Indeed. Um, Thank you for your evidence. You. Could you just confirm that you also, as part of your engagement with stakeholders, spoke to the licensed post office uh, owners? I do not believe we spoke to the licensed post office owner or any representatives of the licensed post office owners. I will take that on notice to confirm for you, Senator. And if you do find you consulted with them, could you confirm that you consulted with both the licensed post office group and POAL? who are actually the larger representative group for licensed post offices. I, I will do. Thank yes, you sir. very much. Thanks, uh, Senator Carr has a quick follow-up question. Um, You're on mute, Senator Carr. <coughs> Sorry. It might not be your fault, but... Yeah. No, clearly. We are 18 months into COVID. How does this still happen? Sorry, Senator Carr, it's still not working. That's Just, that. That's that working now? Dulcet tone, Senator. Thank you very much. Given the statements made on job losses uh, and this, the uh, and Ms. Holgate claims that the, the new alternative delivery reform uh, regulations reflected reform part three, I noticed uh, Ms. Clancy, that Reform Group 3 has a job loss number of 5,066 job losses from postal delivery offices in, in that pathway 3. Can you confirm that figure of 5,066 job, job losses in postal delivery offices? There would, pathway three, the alternate day delivery would reduce roles by 5,066. We would expect that many of those roles could be absorbed into the growing parcels business. And so it would yes. be a smaller number of job losses. 
Yes. So that would see the job, in, but according to your table, this is your table you presented, there's that number there, and of course in pathway four, which you still colluded in your report to government, and in, and in the statement you made uh, in, associated with that report, you actually indicated uh, that that was a matter for the government to consider, even though you weren't recommending it, but you said in addition the government decides to further investigate a potential in a full or a partial divestiture of pastoral business, it should undertake a detailed scoping study in that regard. So the option for the government was put before it by you. Is that also correct? Uh, Senator Carr, look, I, I think... That's the 8,000 job losses. No, so uh, to be clear, what we recommended was that they uh, look at developing a reform of the letters business. Yeah. Right? Yes, because of the that, economics that, of that business four, are not sustainable. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm indicating to you that on pathway four, the 8,000 job losses which you're suggesting is there, and in pathway three, which the government did accept, because it's actually the foundation for their regulations, they have 5,066 jobs cut and up to 1,045 jobs cuts from the post offices directly, a total of 6,111 jobs to be lost. So as we've said before, we put forward a range of different reform pathways to be considered. We did not recommend proceeding with pathway four. We did recommend commencing some of the activities related to pathway one. The others are there for illustrative purposes to understand what the impact of a potential reform might be, but that work actually still needs to be undertaken to, to develop exactly what that service thank, model thank would you, be. But I'm talking about your report which has pathway three, potential divestiture of parcel business with job losses of up to 100, through 190 post office closures of up to 6,111 jobs, according to your own documentation. Well, I, I, our own documentation does say that they should consider uh, options to reform the letters business. We did not recommend any specific job losses other than uh, the impact in the retail uh, area related to the closure of uh, corporate post offices and the efficiencies we recommended in corporate functions. It's hard to know what 1.38 million actually delivered, really. Uh, Senator Hanson. Um, Mr Carrasco, and uh, you are Managing Director and Senior Partner. Ms Clance in Waters, you're the Managing um, Director and a Partner in BCG. Would you stand by your report today in light of Australia Post making huge profits under the leadership of Christine Holgate, a CEO, in light of what um, the profits they have now, would you stand by your report that you've handed to the government in 2020 that they should actually um, continue down that path? Yes. Please. I, I, yes, no, I'm, look, I'm happy to start and my colleagues can add if they wish. Um, I think we undertook the work the way we always do, with a high degree of integrity and rigour um, to ensure that it was robust and accurate. Um, it was done at the time before the impact of the COVID pandemic uh, could be foreseen by anyone, um, and we believe it was the right advice at the time. Okay. And so just to check also, hang, hang do on, you agree sorry. that there are big profits? Because you, your re sorry, Senator report Henderson. doesn't seem to reflect that. Well, I, so the, the situation, as I said earlier, I think is that Australia Post was uh, uh, forecasting, um, it says in our executive summary, very thin profit margins on a turnover of $7 billion. And we saw significant risks, which is why we needed to look into all those growth anymore, opportunities and efficiencies. There, there has been a contract now at uh, Bank at Post, so that's actually now improved the profits of the organisation. So therefore, your report is no longer um, necessary or well, action be taken on it. I think some of the elements of reform pathway three have obviously um, been uh, you know, implemented uh, as part of the temporary relief measures or ah. similar to that. Um, and Service so I think cuts. the uh, the, um, the analysis and the advice has been useful 
to yeah. government in its decision making in how to respond to the COVID pandemic. So, what, so can you Hang just on. explain what you mean by that? So this, you, the alternate mail delivery, for instance, was adopted following your report during COVID? Is that what you're referring no, to? No, I, I have no knowledge of the exact deliberations of the government in relation to the temporary <coughs> relief measures. But right. I'm, as it was pointed out in the earlier hearings, there is some similarity in those. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the information that has been provided has oh, been useful in government decision making. The Department of Finance actually admitted in their summary that they did take that report into consideration. It is Australia Post and the Chair said that they didn't um, implement the report in how they've handled it. So it was actually the government who took that up. Mm. Thanks for uh, clarifying that for us because uh, we've had contradictory evidence and now it's clear as mud. <laughs> Senator McKenzie, final yeah, well, question and then we're, go we're, then we're going on. Oh, we had evidence from the Australia Post board last week that your report told them, and many of them have sat on the board for a long time, nothing new. Um, would you agree? And I hope you don't, because $1.3 million of Australian taxpayers' money to tell the board nothing new about their business um, would be disappointing. If so, what are the new things that your report brought to Australia Post's attention. So we did a range of analysis as part of our report, some of which we believe had not been done previously by either Australia Post nor the shareholder departments. We called Such on, as? Um, I will need to take the, the very specifics on notice. Um, we created this series of pathways that drew on both the experience of Australia Post, but also experience of postal and parcels agencies uh, overseas. Uh, and brought it together as a suite of options that gave, gave government and Australia Post choices uh, in terms of addressing some of the challenges that do exist in, particularly in postal organisations around the world. So you disagree with the Australia Post Board that your report represented nothing new? I believe we brought new, va new value uh, and analysis to bear, yes. Okay. Thank you, Ms Clancy. Thank you for, as I said at the beginning, making yourselves available at short notice. We do appreciate it. And uh, you have given us some evidence that clarifies things, uh, so we're very thankful for that. You've taken some questions on notice and we look forward to reading those. Thank you. Um, we do just have to um, suspend very briefly before our next witness comes up, Mr Nutt, who is a director at Australia Post. Now, if I could just have um, uh, all of the voting members of the committee outside for a moment, please.
broadcasting. If we can resume, thank you very much. I now welcome Mr Tony Nutt, a non-executive director at Australia Post. Mr Nutt, thank you for coming in today. And um, uh, sorry to hear that you were unwell last week. I appreciate you making time for us uh, in person today. Um, it's very good of you. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could I please get you to state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Anthony Basil Nutt. Uh, I'm a non-executive director of Australia Post, uh, but I appear in an individual capacity, given that the board collectively is appearing later, Senator. Yes, thank you very much. Now, um, I invite you to make a short opening statement um, and then we'll go to some questions. Thank you. Senator May, I just have your indulgence for a moment to thank you and all the committee colleagues and the Secretariat for the courtesy extended to me last week. And can I just confirm for the record that I spent two and a half days being extremely ill and would have been physically incapable of appearing. But I just want to note and thank the committee for their courtesy. I know it inconvenienced you. Um, turning to the opening statement, um, Chair, uh, uh, I appear this afternoon, as I've just said, in an individual capacity. Um, at Australia Post, our chair speaks for the Australia Post board and individual part-time non-executive directors speak publicly for themselves. From my perspective, there are a number of important factors relevant to this matter as it sits today. Up to and including some submissions and evidence given to your committee on 27 April 2021, this episode has now morphed, at least in part, into high farce. Straightforward facts, events and actions have been distorted. During this inquiry, for example, it has been asserted that I, quotes, seem to be running the show, in the words of one of the members of the committee, on the 22nd of October. The fact is that Christine Holgate asked for my assistance after her estimate's appearance that day. I spoke to the chair. We agreed ground rules. I explained those to Ms Holgate. I was not a substitute for the chair or for the full board. I was not making decisions. I was, however, able to give Ms Holgate support and counsel. This involved listening to Ms Holgate, who I'd obviously worked closely with for two and a half years, and trying to work through the difficult issues that had emerged just prior to and during that day. Giving her my best advice and keeping the chair updated on our discussions, noting, of course, that he would speak directly to her himself. Leaving aside those specific details for a moment, let me just pick up the broader theme that I was, quotes, running the show, end of quotes. Senators, I can assure you that if I'd been directing events, the wretched watchers wouldn't have been bought two and a half years ago. We also wouldn't have spent some of the money disclosed in answers to Senate estimates questions, quite legitimately asked by Senator Kitching. Thank you. The office of the CEO credit card, now abolished, wouldn't have become a catch-all for some expenses that it should have been more accurately ascribed to other relevant cost centres. And someone with a sharp pencil and an eye for the legislative and regulatory environment in which Post actually operates would have been keeping guard in the CEO's private office so that the inevitable momentum for facilitation of a busy CEO's activities, a culture that predated Ms Holgate, mm. was offset by prudent advice they would listen to at the time they were considering any expenditure. Further, Ms Holgate, an otherwise intelligent, articulate and effective interlocutor with the parliament in general and Senate estimates in particular, wouldn't have given Senator Kitching a partial answer to questions about the watchers. Indeed, had I been directing events, Ms Holgate, faced with an unexpected, rapidly escalating level of deeply hurtful criticism, which she clearly found almost inexplicable, might have stayed the course over the next month or so. By ignoring the short-term politics and the increasingly inaccurate, on occasion completely false and sometimes rather vile commentary, and concentrating on uh, methodically sorting through all the queries of the investigation, Ms Holgate would be the CEO today. Mm. An outstanding CEO, Christine Holgate would now be a little more careful of the numerous technicalities in the extensive legislative and regulatory framework in which Post actually operates as a government business enterprise and a bit more cautious of the inevitably conditional professional relationships a person in her role has across the parliament. Finally, Ms Holgate would be CEO today because she had the support of the chair and every member of the board of Australia Post throughout what was an unexpected and challenging time. 
By lunchtime on 22 October last year, Chair, my assessment was that the watchers, some aspects of the corporate expenditure previously disclosed and the Senate estimates answer to Senator Kitching that day was a problematic cocktail and would need to be dealt with thoroughly. More granular detail would inevitably emerge over the next several weeks as more assertions were made and elements of the media were provided with cherry-picked information from people with their own agendas. Once the government, before question time, had decided to establish an inquiry, the best course of action was to a stake out a strong and principled position, including stating that there had been no improper action, the very finding of the Maddox inquiry. Two, acknowledge error, even if well-intentioned, obviously the situation around the watches, and explain briefly what happened and why. And three, confirm that Ms Holgate would fully assist the investigation and that while she did so, senior executive Rodney Boys would act as CEO for a few weeks as we prepared for our busiest and most important time of the year. Chair, in conclusion, on the basis of known facts and likely contingencies on 22 October, Australia Post, its CEO, the board and our hardworking executive team would come through these issues collectively a bit wiser and with Post a better, stronger organisation with enhanced policies, procedures and systems. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Nutt. Um, I'm going to go first to Senator Kitching. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I did wish to, and thank you, Mr Nutt, for your um, opening statement. And could we have that tabled, if that's possible? Thank you. Um, I wish to address the evidence given by former Liberal Senator Ronaldson given last week. Mr Ronaldson did withdraw his comments, but they were reported. The former senator attended this inquiry by phone, billed as an independent director of Australia Post, a government business enterprise with revenue nearing $8 billion a year. Former Senator Ronaldson did not have the courtesy or grace that you have displayed here, Mr Nutt. He gave evidence he knew to be false, or if we're being charitable, was reckless as to its veracity. And we know where it came from. It came from his political masters. So as this committee considers whether the government has corrupted the governance of Australia Post through political appointments to its board, it's worth reflecting hang, that this committee... Hang on a second, Senator Kitching. Point of order, Senator Henderson. I regret that I am going to have to raise another issue in relation to a senator reflecting on a witness. No, that is not a point of order. Well, it's not. I, it's actually not a point of order. Well, it's not. It is, I've had it checked several it's times. Worth, it's not a point of order. It's, 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 it's worth reflecting that this committee has itself witnessed the sorry spectacle, spectacle of members of that board who yes, are members of the Liberal Party hang, appearing in their capacity as directors, reading out Liberal Party talking points sent by WhatsApp from a very senior member of the Prime Minister's own staff. Former Senator Ronaldson is a former Canberra housemate of current shareholder minister, Senator Birmingham. So he was a well-coached witness by a panicked government, unable to contain a governance crisis in one of our most important government business enterprises. The question is, the question the order, Australian... Order, Senator Henderson. If you don't have a point of order... The question the Australian public no, it's, 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 is entitled to ask it is of not. all of the Liberal Party member appointees to the Board of Australia Post is would a similarly sized, similarly complex private business appoint these Liberal Party I've, hacks... Senator Kitching their... has asked to be able to give an explanation. This is what she is doing. Senator Henderson. Senator Henderson... I'll read that sentence again. Set the question the Australian order. public is entitled to ask of all Liberal order. Party member order. appointees to the board of Australia Post is would a similarly sized, okay. just, similarly just, complex just, yeah, private business I'm, appoint these Liberal Party I, hacks can I, can I, can I to their board of directors? Can I we all know the answer. Can I call the committee answer. to order, please? Thank you. Senate. Senator Kitching, I think we've probably had enough, and I think Senator Henderson, you know, you I, obviously Senator Kitching is responding to what was it put is to not her. A form of can I can I speak yes, without absolutely. being interrupted? Yes, that's also in the standing orders. Senator Kitching uh, is wanting to respond to what was put about in reference to her at the last meeting. I understand that. We do have Senator Nutt now before us. So I think, 
I'm Sorry, happy Mr. To Nutt. This again before Mr. Robinson. Okay, okay. Senator, Danes Senator, Ki Senator Kitching. Senator Kitching, I think what we will, will do is we'll move on to questions uh, to Mr. Nutt. And uh, if you have further questions for Senator Ronaldson, oh, I think uh, he's or now Mr. Ronaldson now, mm, but he's Mr. A Ronaldson, party senator, and in fact before that was a member of the lower house. Chair, I would ask you to bring Senator Kitching to order. You're as oh, please, please. You debate. are as bad as each other. Yes, oh, I, I think debating. that's unfair. Okay. I think that's unfair. I'm All right, well, far I'm better. Not debating. <laughs> far like better, Senator Kitching. Um, Mr. Mr. Nutt, and I will return to this statement because Mr. Ronaldson imputed and gave misleading and false evidence, and in fact, this process by reading out Liberal yeah, Party to point talking point. points, Mr. Ronaldson, of course, point of, of course, the corrupted this inquiry. He corrupted or, or, it. Order. This is outrageous. Order. Okay, is there a question, Senator yes. Kitching? And I will continue reading this statement when the board appears. Senator and if Kitching. any of those board members are to mention me again, and partly, of course, Chair, the reason I have to do it now Sorry. is Senator Henderson interrupted to such an extent is, last a, week that it was impossible to get a question. Chair. No, it isn't, it Senator is Henderson. Read on, okay. Okay. Mr. Okay. Nutt. Okay. Mr. Nutt, were you given a um, direction from the board that you were to deal with Ms. Holgate on that day? Sorry, was I given were you a given direction? A, I know it's board? hard with Senator Henderson here because she does interrupt please, a lot. But were you were you given a direction by the board, or given, um, you know, allowed the board agreed that you would be um, the, the liaison with Ms. Ms. Holgate? Was that minuted? Because I think Mr. McDonald, who's sitting behind you, last week told us that it might not have been minuted. minuted. So the situation. Chair yes, Mark, thank you, Mr. Uh, Nutt. Okay. If you could answer questions, that would be great. Thank you. So the situation is that. After her appearance at Senate Estimates, uh, Ms Holgate uh, rang me. Um, uh, everyone's basically on the phone that day, so it's important to remember that people aren't necessarily all in the room. Uh, secondly, she asked for some advice uh, in handling uh, what had been obviously a, a difficult situation. Uh, I spoke to the chair, and the chair authorised me to assist and support her in the way I've described. And was any of that in writing, even in a WhatsApp message or something? Not in writing, no, it was pretty straightforward. Okay, so, and the rest of the board was party to that information? Uh, they would have been party to that information later in the afternoon. How much later? Because, of uh, course, you can't have directors operating with different levels of knowledge. It would be contrary to the corporation's law. Certainly during the course of the afternoon, uh, when various people were having various discussions, and certainly no later than the beginning of the board meeting, which I think was four o'clock, Senator. Okay, so it was four o'clock, and then you had some sort of suspensions while you spoke to Ms. Holgate. Um, no, no, I, sorry, if, if I may, uh, yes, Chair, just to assist. Um, um, so, uh, with the Chair's permission, I spoke to Christine, sorry, Ms. Holgate, on a number of occasions, uh, up to and uh, during the board discussion. Um, always within the guidelines that I set out in my opening remarks. Mm -hmm. And was the chairman briefed on all of your discussions with Ms Holgate? Well, I had a number of discussions with Ms Holgate by telephone, and I did brief the chair on the substantive matters. Um, I don't know how much information you want now, chair, so please instruct me. No, no. But e essentially, um, there were a number of conversations um, around what was happening that day, the events of the day, the developments of the day, and how best to handle them. And I certainly kept the chair apprised of the substantive issues there. Um, there are also a large number of missed calls, as we're all ringing each other, and there's multiple missed calls. Is it fair to say there was a bit of a frenzy, Mr Nutt? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure I'd use the word frenzy, Chair, but I would say it was an intense day, mm. particularly for Christine Holgate, mm. who had, if I may say so, uh, had breakfast as one of the most respected uh, business leaders in Australia and found during the course of the day that there was all sorts of criticism um, and that that uh, was something that she'd perhaps not experienced at that level of intensity before. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do, do want to ask, is the, other did, did you, Mr Nutt, and the Chair, were you having two different conversations with Ms Holgate? Not as far as I'm aware. We're having um, the chair spoke to her as chair. Yes. He speaks for the board. Uh, my uh, role on the day was to, as I said in my opening remarks, to give support and counsel to Christine Holgate at Ms Holgate's request and with the chair's permission. 
um, that there were not two sort of completely different uh, approaches or something being shown. Did Minister, did Minister Fletcher phone you? He phoned no, the chair. Did anyone uh, he, from the he, Prime Minister's office phone you? No. So no one with a government connection phoned you? Uh, other than I would have had a brief conversation with a member of Paul Fletcher's staff only before question time, just checking to see whether there were any terms of reference for this thing yet. But that was purely mechanical and the answer was no, they'll come in due course. So you were asking if there were terms of reference? Uh, yeah, I just wanted a bit more information than there'll be an inquiry and uh, the government has an expectation that President Holgate will stand aside. But that was a purely mechanical question. But in terms of, just, just, just to be clear, uh, no one from government was ringing me or giving me instructions or anything like that at all. Was it made clear to no, you, either via this conversation with a member of Minister Fletcher's staff or via the conversation with uh, the chairman of Australia Post, that the expectation was that the Prime Minister would call for her to stand aside? Uh, the call with the staff member of Minister Fletcher's office was purely mechanical and there was no such discussion. And um, the uh, indication to the chair prior to question time, you'll recall the chair's given evidence there were two calls. Mm -hmm. um, he raised some issues about the handling in the first call. Uh, the minister, Minister Fletcher, consulted his shareholder colleague and then came back and confirmed that there would be an inquiry and that Ms Holgate should stand aside. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, Were you told, though, that the Prime Minister would be demanding that on the floor of the parliament during question time? Oh, no, time? certainly not. Mm -hmm. Did that take you by surprise that that happened? Um, what happened that day, Senator, if I can put it this way, is that... Uh, and I, I say this quite genuinely, because only a hypocrite can, uh, uh, criticises a senator for doing that sh what she's entitled to do. So Senator Kitching was entitled to ask her questions on notice, and she was entitled to ask her questions about the watchers. That's Senators not Mr Ronaldson. That. that is not Mr Ronaldson's view. Well, and his evidence last week okay. was false okay. and misleading okay. and corrupts this process, okay. and he should okay. know better. OK. Thanks, okay. Senator so, Kitching. So, Mr Nutt. Uh, so, so the only reason I say that, and I, I apologise, I was very indisposed at the time and was physically incapable of doing anything other than being extremely ill. Um, what I, the point I'm making, and, and I'm making this point, I'm not responsible for what other people say. No. I speak in their individual capacities. No. Right. I'm merely saying that I thought the Senator was entitled to ask her questions. What then happened is there were tweets, there were press statements, there was all sorts of commentary. And I just very politely say, as someone who's you know, had the privilege in the past of working in this place, that uh, Mr Fletcher got questions, uh, the Prime Minister got questions, those questions came with you know, um, imputations, and uh, there were very few people in Parliament House that day, uh, perhaps with one or two exceptions, popping over to the National Cathedral to light a candle for the purchase of uh, Cartier watches for senior AP executive staff. Could I ask um, Mr Nutt, you talked about it being a prob problem, problem, problematic cocktail, mm. um, which is a yes, another way of saying uh, you know a shambles or you know a a uh, um, uh, series of events colliding to make this kind of frenzy, intense day, as you put it. Um, Once the Prime Minister had made his remarks so forcefully, and you've worked in this building, you know how this place works, during question time, was it inevitable that Christine Holgate had to stand aside? Uh, well, I think... It really had... wasn't a choice, was it? So there was a range of commentary that day starting at Senate Estimates. Yes, but I'm talking specifically, yeah. look, no. there is no higher mm. position of power than a Prime Minister on his feet in the, in the nation's parliament. So, so, so my, I understand your point, Senator. So my point is that when you look at the controversy immediately beforehand, about a week beforehand, starting about some expenditure around 280, 000, 290,000 
on some corporate services expenditure. The responses of uh, Ms Holgate uh, to Senator Kitching on the watches, uh, and then the, um, which obviously came as a surprise to the board, um, and the uh, commentary of what I call the partial answer. So let, let me just be clear here. Do I think that Christine Holgate lacked an understanding of the public ownership of Australia Post? Of course she didn't. Do I think that Christine Holgate was purposely attempting to be discourteous or to be dismissive of public ownership and the proper use of public money? No, I don't. Um, I do think that in the heated atmosphere of estimates, um, she gave what I call the partial answer, and, um, but I don't think that reflected a considered or uh, full view by Christine Holgate of her responsibilities or Australia Post, etc. That then led to a whole series of commentary, not just by parliamentarians, but by the media, all sorts of people. And that meant that during the course of the day, uh, Christine became you know, under more and more pressure. Uh, what was the situation? Well, leaving aside for a moment what uh, parliamentarians and others had said, given that cocktail, the thing to do was to do the things that I recommended to Christine that she do. Um, and frankly, and I'll finish on this point, Senator, I apologise for going on some length. Um, Christine's, Ms Holgate's a very talented person, started with nothing, built a huge career. She's a very, very capable person. Uh, that morning she had breakfast as one of the most celebrated business leaders in Australia. And during the course of the afternoon, a whole bunch of stuff happened. Uh, that uh, had the effect of uh, confronting her with a you know, very uh, difficult situation. Uh, and that was uh, of a challenge and of a kind uh, that most uh, corporate sector CEOs would not normally no. uh, expect but, to confront. But Mr Nutt, let's, let's be straight. Mm -hmm. There is no more pressure to be born on a member of the public service or a government uh, enterprise, the head of a government enterprise, than when the Prime Minister is on his feet in full flight demanding that you go. Surely. Did well, that not seal Ms Holgate's fate? Well, as I recall the Didn't Prime that, Minister... Isn't that what the board had to consider? Yeah, so as I recall the Prime Minister's remarks, uh, and I don't have a transcript Hansard in front of me, uh, he said you know, this was unacceptable behaviour, uh, that uh, there was going to be investigation, that Ms Holgate should stand aside. And uh, if and she won't, she, she can, can go. go. That's right. So the objective of so it wasn't a choice, was the, it? The well, hang on. The objective of the discussions was to deal with the situation we had in front of us, which is that you do what I said in that opening remarks. Mm -hmm. And the reason you do that is that Australia Post is a public entity. Questions have been raised, fairly or unfairly, um, uh, in a balanced way or an imbalanced way or because of some motivation or another, it doesn't matter, about the use of public money. And you have to deal with that. And had it just been one aspect or another of this, you might have dealt with it in a different way. But that was the aspect that you were dealing with, and that was the aspect that the opposition was dealing with, cross parties were dealing with, um, that the government was dealing with, that the board was dealing with, and there's a proper way of dealing with it. And you step aside, you indicate that um, you, know, you don't believe there was any improper activity, uh, and that's exactly what Maddox found. Uh, you indicate that um, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, it may not have been the smartest thing that a very, very smart woman ever did. Um, but you're going to cooperate fully. You'll step aside for a few weeks and you'll deal with it in, in a proper way. And that, that, was, that was the correct way to deal with this issue. Senator McKenzie. Mr. Mark, Mark can I ask you what the Thank you, Mr Nutt. Sorry, Senator no. Carr. I'm just going to go to Senator McKenzie and then I'll come to you. Um, in your opening statement, you mentioned there was a culture at Australia Post that predated Ms Holgate about how these things were dealt with, the credit card was used, I'm assuming a whole raft of governance matters um, around financial expenditure, including the gifting policy. 
um, that were well in existence prior to Ms Holgate arriving, or indeed yourself. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, look, I was not on the board uh, prior to Ms Holgate being the CEO, so uh, that observation reflects um, the cumulative learnings over two and a half years about the way certain things were done in the past, um, observing certain data on the levels of expenditure mm. in corporate services, etc. It doesn't reflect perfect knowledge or, you know, here's seven case studies that prove that. We've That's had Mr impression. Fahor here before this committee for years, so no. we're kind of across that yeah. level of it. So, um, Given that's the case, what steps did the board or indeed yourself take as a board member to address the issue of revising the gifting policy or indeed uh, the processes that occurred within Australia Post um, that led to, as you said earlier in your evidence, if you had have been in charge, the watches would never have been purchased in the first place. So what steps did you take to make sure that couldn't happen? So when I became a director, I can only speak for myself, just for the moment. Um, I, during my orientation process, not only familiarised myself with the legislative and regulatory environment, not some of the great page turners of Australian literature, I'd have to say, um, but also the processes. And asked the corporate secretary then and um, some of their staff a whole series of questions about policies and procedures around expenses, around credit cards, around audit uh, processes. Mm. Um, and uh, on the basis of the information provided and the policies then in place, they seem to be in order. Um, subsequent to the event, um, and, and of course I should say... But they weren't in order, were they? Because they allowed this event to occur. Yeah. So, so, essentially, and I've alluded to this in my remarks, essentially the difficulty is that the CEO, irrespective of who this individual is, has a lot of um, authority and you can easily have a culture of facilitation. And I think um, um, you can think of many examples in other uh, walks of life, uh, not too far from this building, in which a culture of facilitation can get people into trouble, uh, even when they're not trying to do the wrong thing. Um, so uh, fundamentally here, uh, Ms Holgate decided to buy four watches. Uh, she did it for the best of intentions. Uh, she did not do it for personal benefit. And she did it within her authority as CEO under the Australia Post well, guidelines. Well, you just have to be a little bit careful there. Um, so uh, internal guidelines will not override a legislative and regulatory framework. The point I'm making, respectfully, I'm trying to be helpful, is that um, Ms Holgate on the watches acted with the best of intentions. She received no personal benefit. Mm. Clearly the four staff had done good work. I think this is common ground. Um, if you look at it in terms of, you know, was the form stamped and did she have some capacity to spend some money, etc. Yes. But that doesn't override your legislative and regulatory obligations in the PGP Act. And if you look at the Maddox report, I think, which is a pretty mm. sensible report, mm. does it find that she did anything improper? To be frank, did she pop down to Tiffany's at breakfast and drop a half a million on some diamonds and ride it off to, you know, credit, you know, uh, stationery? Of course she didn't. Um, it was well intentioned, but it was within the provisions of the Act and the requirements, um, you know, an error of judgment. But it was we, terribly well intentioned. Well, we heard evidence last week mm. that um, under the Act, the only issue is that the board has a set of processes in place um, that it's comfortable with. Um, there's actually no even oversight um, from shareholder ministers on the appropriateness of the government-owned enterprises. I'll, I'll just maybe on notice if you could reflect on the testimony um, from last week yeah. to clarify if it was correct to this yeah. committee. Well, so just in terms oh. of what you just, hmm. and I'll leave that for on notice um, for you to have a look at. So essentially, it was a media storm and some political issues that meant that. Miss Holgate was stood aside um, that put the real pressure on for no, her. Uh, oh, sorry, no, respectfully, um, having worked in this building for many years for various prime ministers, um, yeah, there's a media storm. There's a media storm most days. In fact, all of you work pretty hard to whip one up, <coughs> depending on which side of the fence you are. Um, secondly, uh, 
but they're also matters of substance. And the matters of substance was there was some controversy about some corporate services expenditure in the week or so beforehand, 280, 290,000. There was controversy on the day about watches, which appeared uh, to be expensive, which appeared to be, and, and are expensive, as you know, the mm. average person doesn't mm. drop six and a half grand on a watch. Um, uh, so there were subst substantive issues there about whether that was good use or proper use of public money. And there was the impression, which I'm sure was not intended by Ms Holgate, of a certain dismissiveness, you know, oh, it's, you know, commercial money. It's not, it's not public money. It's not taxpayers' money, if you look at the hand side. So the combination of those things uh, uh, meant that there were substantive issues and then there was controversy and commentary about it. But the substantive issues, government decided, as government is entitled to do under the Act, ministers are entitled, and they did before question time, to have an inquiry. Uh, that's their right. And that's what they decided to do, which means you then have a reality to deal with, leaving aside, respectfully, Senator, all the commentary and, mm, you mm. know. Um, do you think Ms Holgate was owed an apology? Uh, by Australia Post? Mm. Uh, not by Australia Post. Who by? Uh, these matters are still on foot, including issues of mediation being discussed at present. So, you know, I don't want to be drawn on that. But suffice to say that I think the totality of commentary, media commentary, commentary from various places, meant that someone who, and I, if I may, if Senator Carr will forgive me for drawing something Senator Carr said on the 13th, it's a complimentary reference I have to add, Senator. <laughs> um, um, he, he made a very astute observation, which is what happens to people who haven't had much uh, experience in dealing with the vigour of a robust parliamentary system. And even CEOs, and Christine's highly intelligent, articulate, robust, resilient sort of person, and you don't get to her position in life without being so. Um, you know, that was a level of... Uh, commentary, and that increased between that day and mm. the second. And what that meant was that she was placed under enormous pressure. So the totality of the situation was much more than a CEO would normally expect to get, certainly starting from, you know, um, a, a pleasant breakfast and you wind up going home for dinner. Thank you, Mr Nutt. Look, um, do you support divestiture of non-core business of Australia Post? Uh, Senator, I want to be very clear about this. I'm with Bob Menzies. Bob Menzies said that a person doesn't have to be a socialist to think the government should own the post office. So I support 100% public ownership. I don't support any divestiture of uh, Australia Post uh, assets. I don't support privatisation. Uh, I don't support breaking off in something very important like the parcels business. Um, and can I just briefly say why without, you know, I appreciate you're on, on a timeline here, Senator. Um, I don't support it because it's bad public policy. It's bad public policy because, for instance, if you uh, divested uh, parcels, you would put an enormous financial hole in the finances of Australia Post. You only need to look at the financials, which I won't bore you on the tedium of those, to know what that would do. So it's bad financially. Secondly, it's bad public policy. Um, a number of members of this committee have made the point quite correctly that it would affect LPOs, it would affect jobs, it would affect the viability of Australia Post's capacity to do everything that it's expected to do in terms of community service obligations. So bad idea, bad policy, bad finances, and while consultants and others can make their points, that's terribly interesting, and the board can you know, have a briefing on it, that's terribly interesting, but at the end of the day, um, such people provide advice or guidance or suggestions, uh, and in the words of Peter Costello, uh, once in the House of Representatives, they advise and I decide. Um, just finally, then, given the changes to e-commerce, uh, the 21st century is upon us, and the fundamental changes in our purchasing uh, post-COVID, do you see parcels now as core business for Australia Post going forward? Absolutely. Well, I look forward to you supporting my private members' amendment. I'm happy to have a look at it, Senator. Chair, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Senator Carr. 
Thank you. I won't detain you long, Mr Nutt. You're a very experienced uh, political... You guys need uh, am, I, am I still on mute? No, sorry. Can you hear me? Uh -huh, I'm oh, just... Not. You're not. Continue. What a shambles. <laughs> I, I apologise, Senator. I, I now can't hear the Senator. And you're not a cat. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Nutt, you're a very experienced political officer and a highly accomplished one at that. Uh, I mean, the question arises in regard to the privatisation of Australia Post. Not only is it bad policy, but it's bad politics, isn't it? Yes, uh, my attitude is that it's the perfect example where good public policy and good politics are precisely the same. Um, if you try and privatise Australia Post, uh, you'll be in deep doo-doo. Yes. Can I ask you then about another aspect of politics? When did you discover that the Prime Minister had used the word, the Chief Executive has been instructed to stand aside? Uh, whenever that particular remark went public, uh, I had no advanced knowledge of it or consultation, if that's your point, Senator. No, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting it is. You've already indicated that you weren't given prior warning. It, it was on the 22nd of October in question time, he made the comment that the Chief Executive has been instructed to stand aside. W when were you made aware that he had made the statement to the House of Representatives? Uh, I would have been at that exact moment um, in transit um, because I was going for, for between appointments. Um, so I would have caught it caught up with that within minutes of him saying it. Um, um, that would have been the situation, Senator. Fair enough, I would expect that. And I'd ask you, what did you understand those words to mean? That there'd been inquiry and that Ms Holgate had been um, asked or instructed or however you want to kind of phrase it, to stand aside during that inquiry. And I'm instructed by whom? Uh, well, my understanding is that, and I think this is on the record through the Australia Post chair, that the Minister for Communications had been in touch with the chair. Uh, the chair had raised some issues um, around that. There had been a further conversation with the chair uh, after Minister Fletcher had spoken to Minister Cormann, they being the two shareholder ministers, as you know, Senator, um, and that that occurred before question time. Uh, and that the chair, as I understand it, had spoken to Ms Holgate prior to question time. So, Mr Nutt, you'd be also aware that the word instructed carries with it uh, certain legal implications, does it not? Well, it was certainly... I mean, it depends what you've been said. Are we having a discussion about whether or not this constitutes a direction under... Is it 47 or 48? Senator, I call you mentioning this at the 13th, but I can't right. remember the clause for the moment. Yes, and that's, and that's the point I'm making, obviously. At what point was there an understanding within the board that of a, a legal nature of the use of the term instructed? OK, so I think the chair has previously given evidence that uh, he did not regard his conversations with the minister as an instruction within the meaning of that clause of the Act, but it was clearly the disposition of government, the strong disposition yes. of government, that um, uh, there be an inquiry. They're able, as you know, Senator, a very experienced former minister, uh, to issue an instruction for an inquiry, and they're capable of um, 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 not only calling for an inquiry, but um, indicating yes. a strong disposition that she stand aside. So, Mr. Knott, that's my point exactly. There was no, the chairman made the point that it wasn't a legal instruction because it hadn't been conducted in a legal way, and therefore he felt that it wasn't, it didn't meet the criteria for that particular subsection of the Act. However, it was a strong disposition of government and was being treated as such within the board, and therefore the normal provisions of natural justice and procedural fairness were not being followed. Would that be a reasonable? line of argument to be pursued? No, I think it is fair to say that there was a clear disposition from government. Um, uh, the board had to deal with the matter. Um, there were discussions which I was having with Ms Holgate and which um, uh, the chair also had with Ms Holgate about the best way to handle this matter. And that was, frankly, um, 
to uh, stand aside and take the other steps I outlined in my statement. Um, uh, and but this was being discussed with um, Ms Holgate. This was not being sort of just kind of, oh, by the way, Christine, here's a phone call. This is what's happening. Um, the whole sure. point of the discussions was to work through these issues uh, in a uh, professional way. That's, see, that's what troubles me. There was no legal advice sought. There was no consultation uh, with Ms Holgate in regard to contractual obligations. There was a presumption that the Prime Minister had made a statement and that was to be implemented, and Ms Holgate's rights in this matter were to be, be disregarded. Would that be a fair assumption for me to make? No. Um, there would be, no. Respectfully, there would be a, a fair assumption that government had announced, as it's lawfully entitled to do, through the two shareholder ministers who own Australia Post in trust, small t trust, for the people of Australia, mm. that there would be an inquiry. There was a strong disposition indicated by ministers prior to question time and by uh, the Prime Minister during question time that Ms Holgate would stand aside during this process. Uh, yes. These matters were discussed extensively, including by me, with Ms Holgate uh, in a professional, calm, sensible way. Uh, and uh, it was not necessarily to um, uh, proceed down the standing aside process uh, by the board because on the advice of the chair to the board, Ms Holgate agreed to stand aside. I apologise See, for the long answer, Senator. No, that's all right, Mr. I think I can only expect that it would always be in a calm uh, manner from yourself. But you see, the statement was the chief executive has been instructed to stand aside, and if she doesn't wish to do that, she can go. Surely that's a highly intimidatory statement from the Prime Minister to be making on the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, Senator, uh, inquiry was called. There was a disposition, a strong disposition, indicated that Ms Holgate step aside. Leaving aside that process, it was simply good common sense for Australia Post and for Christine herself, if I may refer to her by her first name just in passing, yes. um, to handle this matter in a way that would deal with the substance of the issues that have been raised. And the substance and of the that issues that have been raised were corporate expenditures, watches, and whether or not she and the board, and I myself was part of the board in 2018, um, uh, were going to be looked at in terms of the terms of reference when they were published as set out in the so, Maddox report. Senator Carl, so, Mr. We, no, are gonna, we are going to have to move on. Just one final question. So the reference here, if she doesn't wish to do that, she can go. What do you think that meant? Um, the Prime Minister's in the public record. Uh, if you wish to uh, uh, ask the Prime Minister what he meant or what was precisely in his mind or what the range of contingencies were. How do you interpret those words? She can go. How would any reasonable person, particularly a person of your standing, your experience, how would you interpret those words, he can go? I, I respectfully refer you, Senate, Senator, to the uh, House of Representatives' hands art. I'm sure an experienced senator like yourself, a former minister, can do your own detective work. Thank you, Mr. Nutt. Thank, Thank you, you Senator. S senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. Thank you uh, for your evidence today. Um, so hoping you can help us. The board presented evidence that Ms Holgate agreed to stand aside and they cite the evidence of the two phone calls between her and the chair and subsequent emails on separate occasions to her colleagues wishing them all the best uh, and that she offered her resignation in writing seeking a response which was provided and that she released a public statement of her resignation to the media. Ms Holgate contests elements of that. You are clearly in the midst of that fray. Could you give us your assessment, your recollection of what occurred and why there's a disparity between those two accounts? So we're talking about the 22nd and the 2nd? We're talking about the standing aside and about the fact that she resigned. Okay, so there's two lots of issues here, Senator, so I'll try and yes. keep it contained. I appreciate your colleagues have questions. Um, on the second, I and the chair had various discussions with Ms Holgate. Uh, I had a number of phone calls with Ms Holgate, and I'm happy in due course, chair, to provide my phone records to assist the uh, that would committee. Be helpful. Thank you, Mr. 
Can I, uh, could I just clarify? I thought I may have misheard, but I thought you said the second, and I, I assume you're referring to the 22nd of October. No, no, no. Sorry, I, I, the question. I, uh, my apologies. Okay. The, I asked Senator Fawcett whether he meant both the standing aside day, oh, okay. so, yes, the sorry. 22nd, and the resignation day, the 2nd, which... So let's uh, just... The 2nd of November. Se yes, 2nd of November and the 22nd. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Mm -hmm. Was that... Is that correct, yeah, Senator? That yeah, correct. Okay. So um, both the Chair and I had um, a number of discussions with Ms Holbach during the course of that day. The key point, I think, was that the Chair's indicated that in a phone conversation uh, with her at 5.50, and this has all been given in evidence, um, that uh, Ms Holgate reluctantly agreed to step aside um, to, uh, for you know, the period of the uh, investigation. And of course, you have evidence from Ms Holgate that makes this a point of tension between the two of them. I think that's pretty clear. Um, uh, the chair reported to the board shortly after that 5.50 call that he had had a discussion with Christine, which had reluctantly stepped a, stood aside. Um, uh, and if you just think of the day, and without being tedious, Chair, and re repeating my earlier commentary, this was a very difficult and challenging day for Christine Hoggo. Sounds um, like it was difficult and challenging for all of you. Well, it, it, yes, that's true. And, and certainly um, I've um, dealt with a number of these highly sensitive uh, situations down the years. Uh, and this was, you know, a, a difficult and challenging, but 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 for Chris, but for Chris, Christine Hoggart as well. And this is a, just so there's no misunderstanding. This is a highly intelligent, articulate, senior professional woman for whom I have respect. Okay, so I'm not saying anything other than it was a difficult no, day. Um, so that's the point of tension. But there, that basically he said that she agreed. She says she doesn't agree. Um, the uh, chairman reported to the board. The board then took certain flow on action that day. Um, and um, so that's the 22nd. Um, on the 2nd... Um, of November. Oh, oh, my apologies. Thank you, Chair. Of November. Um, basically, we received um, a letter and a press statement, etc., cetera, um, in the terms that you have. Um, and um, it seemed pretty clear that after a very difficult period between the 22nd and the 2nd that Kristen had decided, oh, sorry, Ms Holgate, I don't mean to be discourteous, had decided for the reasons she set out, particularly in a press statement, um, which was very clearly written by her, it's <coughs> not a corporate press statement, um, that she had decided to, to resign and um, uh, for the reasons that she indicated, which were basically um, to prevent Australia Post from further distraction and because of her own health. And they're clearly set out in those statements. And uh, we dealt with it accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, I'm very conscious of time here and the Chair's giving me the, uh, the wind up. Um, you mentioned that the inquiry identified that she had done nothing uh, outside the Australia Post's uh, requirements in terms of expenditure, it was within no, their guidelines, but no. you thought that it perhaps didn't follow, or their guidelines didn't follow the PGPA in terms of what it indicated. But my, my question is to the fact, were there any other concerns that were subsequently raised about expenses uh, that the CEO incurred uh, as a result of that inquiry that resulted in the board giving directions to the executive of Australia Post to change their practices internally. So may I respectfully just, respectfully, Senator, correct you. Um, the point I make, and it's quite clear from the Mannix report, which is a matter of public record, uh, there's basically two aspects to it. Was there improper activity? You know, was, was this improper? Was this for personal benefit? No, it was not. And that's very clearly stated in the Mannix report. The second thing that's very clearly stated is that the purchase of the watches was inconsistent with uh, the PGP Act. And the way I characterise that is an error in good faith from otherwise very, very capable I, person. I, I accept all that. Um, my, my question is subsequently, were yes. there other areas where you gave direction yes. to Australia? Post? So, so subsequent to this issue arising internally, Australia Post uh, reviewed under Acting CEO Rodney Boyce and reporting to the board uh, 
a lot of processes and procedures, uh, both of our own motion work and through the work from Maddox, we've made, I think it's 32, this is in evidence previously given, 32 adjustments to processes and procedures around credit cards, authorisations, et cetera, to make sure that these are fully robust. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. you. We, we, Senator Hanson. Um, Mr Hart, you actually had conversations with Ms Holgate on the 22nd of October. I did, Senator. the whole afternoon. Um, apart from um, the chair, do you know of any other director that actually spoke to her? Uh, my knowledge is only the chair and myself. Right. You were having conversations with her on the phone, but also via email, is that correct? Uh, she sent me a couple of emails, that is correct. All right. There's evidence by the chair that at 5.50 you had a conversation with her and that she agreed to stand aside. Is that correct? Uh, that's the evidence of the chair and that's the uh, information you provided to the board. Right. There's also evidence here that she sent an email to you at 6.03 and 6.41 p.m. still stating she is agreeing to take annual leave of two weeks annual leave, that she did nothing wrong, she's not standing aside. If she's still conversing with you, the chair told the board, you, you, your board convened again at six o'clock. Yes, that's correct. The chair told the board that she's agreed to stand aside. At what point did you stand up and tell the directors and the board, no, I'm sorry, Miss Holgate is not saying that. She's still sending me emails that she intends to actually take two weeks leave. What point did you tell the board that? So if you're talking about an email at 6.40, no, 6.03 and 6.41, and also there was an email at 5.53pm which she stated to you that she has done nothing wrong, she does intend, she says, I would like to take two weeks annual leave immediately to enable you to understand an investigation. Uh, so she sent an email, um, but at 6.03 she sent you an email, again she sent you an email at 6.41pm. And I'm saying, if the board raised it, because your board meeting finished at 6.20, at what time did you tell the chair and the directors, well, I'm sorry, Miss Holgate is telling me totally different. That is not my understanding. So, Senator, the position of two weeks leave and a two-line media statement had been sent to me well before the 5.50 discussion, well before the board uh, reconvened. Um, uh, sorry, it just, been... just, just say that again. What so, happened? No, no, so it's very straightforward. So yep. during the course of our discussions during the day, uh, Ms Holgate was also having discussions with a lot of external advisers. It would appear from her subsequent submissions that they included a lawyer and a range of other people, and then she's entitled to do that. Let's, um, let's Mr. Get to Mr. The Nutt, we are running very short oh, on time. Right. Mr. So, Nutt, I'm sorry, I'm not Senator interested. Senator Hanson in, has asked a, a direct question. I'm not interested in the other. Uh, what she spoke to anyone else. Mm -hmm. I'm going directly to you. Yeah. I'm saying that she had these telephone conversations, yeah. she had these emails directly sent to you, that she's saying she is not standing down. She wants two weeks leave. You knew that in your conversations with her. At what point did you argue with the board and directors that she has not agreed to stand down? Okay, so the... Or sit did you, Mr Nutt? No, well, hang on. So I, I, I'm conscious of your time, Senator. I'm not trying to be difficult, so I'll see if I can concentrate this. During the course of the day, and up to and including my last discussion with her, prior to the... Uh, board reconvening. Um, her position was that she wanted to take two weeks leave and issue a two-line statement. She had communicated that to me both verbally and in an early email. I think, and I'd need to check, I apologise, Chair, somewhere around 4.54. I'd uh, communicated this to the Chair. I'd had various discussions with her about the adequacy or otherwise of that as a working hypothesis. And uh, so, sorry, Mr. Nutt, just to be clear, you didn't think that was appropriate? No. So, uh, if, if I, I may, uh, answering your question, Senator. Um, so, uh, it took uh, the departments about seven days to get the Maddox inquiry underway. Okay. Um, so, really, what was being put was that 
um, you know, shortly after the inquiry actually got up and running, which it did on the 30th of October, that the CEO would return to work. Mm -hmm. The issue there is in a couple of parts, if I may respectfully well, put this. Let's, 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 I, I, I want to go back to Senator Hanson because she has the call, but I just want to be clear. Yep. You were well and truly aware of Ms Holgate's preference of two weeks leave uh, and a short statement explaining that. Yes, yes. And, and and did you no. did you uh, inform your board colleagues yep. Yep. So, of that yep. so, and that that and that that was her position? Yep. So so there's two things here which is getting a bit confused. So yes, I informed the chair uh, both during the course of the afternoon and by forwarding the email and by talking to him. It's a fairly straightforward proposition: two weeks leave and and, and a mm -hmm. short statement. Um, uh, the chair spoke to, uh, and I had a conversation with Christine shortly before <coughs> the chair's, sorry, Ms. Holgate, shortly before the chair's discussion with her at 5:50. So everyone knew that bit of information, uh, and the chair has advised uh, both publicly and through the board that she had agreed to uh, stand aside. She says it's a point of tension, as we said earlier, that she did not agree. Uh, so back, to, back to Senator Hanson. Yeah, so, Mr no, no, no. Nutt, please answer, answer my question. Yeah, yeah. At no. any time on October the 22nd, did Ms Holgate tell you she had agreed to stand aside? If so, when? Yeah, so, Just answer the question, yeah, yes no, or no? no. no, no. Did she? So, yeah, hang on, Just respectfully. So. Um, I said to Christine in a phone call shortly before she spoke to uh, Lucio that I thought our discussions had gone about as far as they could go, uh, that she needed to speak to the chair because the chair spoke for the board and had been in touch with ministers. She then spoke to the chair within 30 seconds or so uh, by ringing him. That's a matter of record. There's a disagreement between the two of them as to what they discussed or didn't discuss. Now, it is the case that the board then met, the chair advised the board, etc. You're aware of all of that. It is also true that after the board meeting, uh, or uh, certainly in terms of my getting it, because I was in attendance at you know, six o'clock, so I wasn't sitting there reading my emails, uh, but it is true, just to be clear, Senator, that during the course of the evening after the board meeting, uh, that uh, Christine sent me a couple of emails, which were exactly the same uh, uh, emails that she'd sent earlier in the day, which were talking about two weeks and... Um, Correct. She was still saying that. No, so sorry. her supposedly having this conversation with the chair, saying that she would agree to stand aside, doesn't add up, because why would she still send an email to you at no. 6.41 what? saying that she will take two weeks and you'll leave? Okay. You have so not answered my question. Did she actually tell you she would stand aside? Yes or no? Uh, she didn't tell me that. No. She told the and chair you, that. And well, you're well, all... you, are, you believe she told the chair that? Yep. But, so right. the, the, so but evidence said that the phone call, she was on the phone to you when Lucio, the chair, tried to ring her. When she rang back to talk to him, it was Sue Davies that spoke to her in the car. And Sue Davies' evidence said that at no point did Miss Holgate say to, to the chair that she would stand down because she never took the phone call from the chair. It was Sue Davies that was on the phone call to him at 5.50, not the chair. So the chair did not have confirmation from Miss Holgate that she would stand down. Sorry. Okay. Oh, so, uh, Mr Nutt, um, becoming... you've answered the question and we really are short on time. Yes. I'm going to go to Senator Henderson and then we're going to invite the rest of the board members in. Senator Henderson, please. If there, are, if there are questions that could go to the rest of the with the rest of the board here, that would be helpful. But it's yep. over to you. Thanks, Chair. I'll try and be as quick as I can be. Uh, Mr. Nutt, good afternoon. Thank you for your time today. You've you've made it quite clear in your evidence that you believe um, Christian Holgate was an outstanding CEO, and you said in your opening statement that by ignoring the short-term politics and the increasingly inaccurate, on occasion, completely false and sometimes rather vile commentary. Uh, and concentrating on sorting through the queries of the investigation, you believe that you would still be CEO today? I do. What, can you expand on why you believe that to be the case? Because fundamentally, what, what's the substance of the issue? There's some controversy about corporate expenditure 
and there was controversy about four watches. The four watches were obviously a error of judgment and inconsistent with the Act according to the Maddox report. But they were not an improper act. They were the act of a highly capable person who made an error of judgment with the best of intentions to reward people who had done a really good job for Australia Post under her leadership and brought in a lot of money. So on the substance of the issues, on the substance of the issues, um, and bearing in mind that an investigation can sometimes find something else, but on the substance of the issues on the day, um, it would seem to me that there was uh, a process to be worked through, but that the, the issues didn't lend themselves to, uh, you know, um, a scenario in which you would leave the organisation, because there were issues to be worked through, but I didn't have anything in front of me that suggested impropriety. So and there was no... Uh, there's some substantive issues about the use of the public's money in a GBE. Um, they were entitled to be worked through. Uh, the government was entitled, as it's, they own the company, to call an inquiry and to work them through. Um, the question was, you know, work it through sensibly, uh, and then Christine would have returned to work with the full support of the chair and the board. Uh if, Mr Nutt, there's been obviously some contention in relation to whether Ms Holgate agreed to stand aside for the purposes of the investigation. Um, Ms Holgate says she was unlawfully stood down. Do you agree with that proposition? Um, on the information available to me, as reported by the chair to the board, and the board then acted on that, um, she well, agreed. Sorry, no, I just can well, I just finish? Well, can I just can I? You don't okay. get to have a free run yourself. Okay. okay. Can I just hear Mr. Nutt's yeah. answer, please? No, so, no, so, no, because so, you interrupt everyone else, Sarah. Yeah. It, it it does make it difficult for the witness to give an answer if sure we're is. sort of constantly, respectfully, to Thanks, Mr. elected members of parliament present, um, uh, particularly when the propositions put, and this is not a reference to Senator. Henderson, but may have been a reference to Let's earlier questions. Let's get to the question, difficult. the answer to the question, Mr. Nutt. Come on. Sure. So, uh, do you want to just remind me, Senator, where we are? Yes. So, um, there's been contention about whether Ms. Holgate ag agreed mm. to stand aside. Yep. Uh, Ms. Holgate, in her evidence, says that she was unlawfully stood down. Do you agree with that proposition? Not on the information available to me. And why do you say that, Mr. Nutt? because on the information available to me, uh, as reported by the chair to the board, after a difficult conversation in which uh, Ms Holgate clearly was, you know, reluctant, um, she indicated to the chair that she would step down um, and uh, there's other evidence available that's been presented by Australia Post um, to the inquiry uh, about uh, what she was doing and saying in the days afterwards, consistent with that. Thank you, Mr Nutt. Chair, I do have That's other questions, but I'll thank wait you. for the next section. We're just going to take you. a short suspension for five minutes while we get the rest of the board in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Nutt.
We can. Just before we officially uh, hear from the board members, we're just going to let the media take a couple of photos of the shot. And we're smiling. <laughs> Senator Carr, look up, look interested. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I now welcome non-executive directors of the Board of Australia Post, as well as Mr Nick McDonald, the General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of uh, Australia Post. Now, I know we've got um, limited seating at the front here, so if there's questions uh, to uh, others, we'll just do a bit of a, a chair shuffle. Um, but apologies for that, that's just the, the, the space that we have. Um, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could I get you each to state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? We might start with you down this end, Mr. McIver. I'm Bruce McIver, non executive director of Australia Post. Anthony Basil, not non executive director of Australia Post. Lucia Di Bartolomeo, chair of Australia Post. And Jan Lewis, <coughs> non executive director of Australia Post. Thank you. And um, as other uh, witnesses come to the table, they'll just need to introduce themselves, OK? I think we'll, we'll keep it uh, like that to get moving. Now, um, I understand, Senator Kitching, you have um, a statement you'd like to table. I will table this in relation, as um, before I was interrupted by Senator Henderson, it's in relation to evidence given by former Liberal Senator Ronaldson, um, and it goes to uh, his instruction by the Prime Minister's office um, to categorise to categorise evidence in a particular way. I understand if uh, Mr. Ronaldson wishes to respond. Not yet, but when you, after we've had the opening statements, then up to you. You can swap and respond if you like. But um, I just want to try and keep this moving on. Uh, now, I invite you, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, you, this is our uh, third visit by you to this inquiry today. I do appreciate it and I do thank everybody for making the effort to come in person. Um, you would understand it's much easier to be able to go through some of these more contentious and sensitive issues in uh, person. So I really do appreciate the effort that you've all made today. Um, Thank you. And Mr Chairman, do you have a statement that you would like to give? I Does do, anybody, Chair. Do any other members of your board have I, a statement? I believe I have the only statement to make. Okay. On. <clears throat> so thank you, Chair. I would like to make an opening statement. We recognise the important work of the committee in this inquiry. The board and management continue to treat this inquiry seriously, devoting considerable time and resources, and maintaining our cooperative approach to assist the committee. While we can appreciate the interest in the events of last year, I firmly believe the focus is overshadowing the material change challenges facing Australia Post, particularly as the nation starts to emerge from the COVID-19 economic crisis. As a board, we are firmly focused on the future. That's what is expected of us. With about 80 cents in every dollar of revenue now coming from intensely competitive markets and the deterioration of the traditional lettuce business we need to continue to transform Australia Post to remain relevant and ensure we can continue to provide support to businesses and communities across the country. Like postal businesses around the globe, we are confronting unprecedented change driven by increasingly digital world. The lettuce business has now been in structural decline for more than a decade and the pandemic driven by an increasingly digital world. Yes, growing online shopping has significantly increased volumes in the parcels business, but to provide some context, the drop in letter volumes during COVID is nearly three times the parcels growth. With significant letter losses, despite recent stamp price increases and new parcel delivery competitors emerging, our capacity to maintain our high standards in serving our customers is being stretched. 
In such a tough operating environment, we will need to continue to embrace our culture of innovation and add new financial and government services to deliver, deliver on our commitment to maintain our network of community-based post offices. I recognise there have been questions from the committee about the circumstances surrounding last year's departure of former Chief Executive Christine Holgate. These have been extensively canvassed during this inquiry. However, with its 200 year history and an extended workforce of 75,000 plus, Australia Post is an organisation that is much bigger than any one person. In er earlier evidence to this committee, I stated Christine Holgate was a very good Chief Executive of Australia Post. As a board, we stand by that assessment and genuinely wish her best in, in all her future endeavours. But I want to be clear, Australia moved on some time ago and consistent with Ms Holgate's comments in her resignation letter, we have been fully focused on serving our customers. It is now six months since Ms Holgate resigned from Australia Post with immediate effect. While we were sad to see her go, shortly afterwards we started a search for a replacement CEO. We had no choice, we had to look forward. That is the job of a board, to, to provide strong and considered leadership to ensure our executive team and our people can get on with the jobs serving the community. The facts pertaining to the now infamous Cartier watches are quite clear. The Banker Post refresh was a significant milestone for the organisation. The Maddox investigation found the purchases of the watches as additional recognition was not approved by the board or supported by reward and recognition policy. The investigation also found there was no indication of dishonesty, fraud, corruption or intentional misuse of Australia Post funds the purchase of the watches was simply inconsistent with obligations under the PGPA Act regarding the proper use and management of resources with inconsistent, which, which was inconsistent with public expectations. Yeah. Finally, that despite Ms Holgate's assertion, she had no specific authority to spend 150,000 on individual rewards for staff. Maddox identified no such authority in their investigation report. And the only reference to that figure is the limit in the office of the CEO credit card. Similarly, the facts surrounding Ms Holgate's departure last year are quite simple. It is a fact that on the 22nd of October, Ms Holgate agreed to stand aside from her role as CEO while the independent inquiry was taking place. Supporting our submission, my earlier evidence to the committee are both my phone records and Ms Holgate's phone records. The 23rd October email from Ms Holgate where she thanks CEO Rodney Boyce for agreeing to lead the team. And the 25th of October email also from Ms Holgate saying, as I step away and let Rodney lead. It should be remembered that at the time, the board's objective was, subject to the finding of the investigation, to have Ms Holgate back in the CEO role as soon as possible. <coughs> the board wanted Ms Holgate to continue as CEO and did not at any time encourage or pressure her to resign. This is an important point, And there has been no evidence to the inquiry that suggests otherwise. Rather, we coordinated, personal, we coordinated personal support and professional counselling for Ms Holgate during that clearly, what was clearly a stressful time in high pressure circumstances. When Ms Holgate resigned on the 2nd of November, the board was disappointed but completely understood why she considered it would be untenable for her to continue as CEO. As per her resignation note to the executive team, in addition to her personal circumstances, Ms Holgate recognised the watches was an issue it was a significant distraction for Australia Post through her resignation, was hoping the organisation could focus on serving the customers. And that's what Australia Post has been doing, endeavouring to build a stronger, smarter and better business. As the Australia Post Chair, I am committed to growing the business. There is no secret privatisation agenda. Privatisation was consi has consistently been ruled out by government and I can confirm the committee to the committee that it has never been discussed by the board. The reality is we want to keep investing in the organisation and our people to continue to grow the business. We want to keep investing in our deliveries business to improve capacity, reliability and customer satisfaction. We want to keep investing in our network to entrench the role of the local post offices in the community. Parliament has played its role, helping us provide a sustainable postal service through the volatility of COVID as we adapted to meet the changing needs of the community. Last year, we sought temporary regulatory relief from, 
from the government to help us better manage the unprecedented demands and reposition the business by redeploying 2,000 posties to deliver parcels in vans. The request for temporary regulatory relief was not linked in any way to the BC BCG report. The drafts of the BCG report seen by Australia Post did not assume a global health pandemic resulting in a national lockdown, the introduction of movement, restric uh, movement restrictions for all Australians and the grounding of the entire Qantas fleet and land-based land transport options, at the same time as a massive surge in parcel volumes and significant drop in letters. All of these factors led to the request for temporary regulatory relief. The su support provided by temporary regulatory relief has been invaluable and, is no, and there is no question it is enabling Australia Post to deal with the ongoing changes and impacts of COVID. Importantly, the regulatory relief has helped protect the health, safety and well-being of our people as they serve the community. A, a strong performance on the serious injury rates, despite the immense growth in workloads, was remarkable and reflects the benefits of the temporary changes. While the question of whether this relief should be further extended on a temporary basis remains a matter for government, it is now clear that we can't go back to where we were. Since the peak of the volumes back in 2008, Various independent reviews of Australia Post have determined that to deliver on our dual purpose of meeting our community service obligations and not being a financial burden to the taxpayer, regulatory reform of some description is required. Now that COVID has driven further structural change, this task is even harder and more urgent. Australia Post is continuing reviewing how it best meet the, meet the future needs of our customers and subsequent demands on our services. In determining ultimately what will be the framework for a sustainable Australia Post, we are committed to consulting with our people, union representatives, licensees, communities, customers and other valued stakeholders to develop a mutually beneficial outcome. A constructive and cooperative approach is the, the key and we are confident now the new normal is emerging that the benefit of time we can land in the right place. Before handing over to the questions for to the board, I would encourage senators to consider a rational assessment of the evidence provided to this inquiry. Christine Holgate was a, a good chief executive of Australia Post. Everyone agrees the purchase of Cartier watches was the wrong call, but the decision did not deserve the intensely critical and very public unilateral external condemnation. Ms Holgate resigned from Australia Post six months ago. We have appointed an experienced, highly capable replacement. The board did not encourage or pressure Ms Holgate to resign. The challenges facing the business are immense, but we are committed to working with our stakeholders to build a sustainable business that can meet the changing needs of our customers. As a board, we remain focused on the future. There are no plans for privatisation. Instead, our strategy is to invest to grow the business. Our experienced executive <coughs> team have provided strong leadership despite the intense public scrutiny. While our people take great pride in the work, they are methodically getting on with the job, and that's what we should all do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Senator Carr, I'll go to you first. Chair, could we get Mr De Bartolomeo to, chair, to table that? Yes, could you table? Could yes. we have your statement? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carr. Try the, try oh. the, mute, try the mute button. Perfect. We can hear you. Is, is Senator Kitchen? I thought she was uh, wishes to no, start I might, off. Is that... I might start. Oh, okay. I'm happy now, if that's how Labor want to run it. That, Senator Kitchen. Um, now, Mr. Di Bartolomeo, of course, not all of the board agreed that purchasing cardio watches was inappropriate, did they? I believe they did. Oh, Mr Ronaldson from last week seems to have a very different view. Um, could I ask you, when did you first initiate steps to hold a board meeting on the 22nd of October? So what time of the day? OK. Uh, I had uh, discussions with the minister around about 1.30. I'm just going by memory. Was that after your second phone call with him? It was after the second phone call, yes. OK. Um, and how did you convene the board? How did you tell the board that you were having a board meeting? Uh, I rang, first of all, Nick McDonnell as company secretary, and I started ringing some other directors directly, uh, <coughs> informing them of the conversation uh, that I'd had with the minister, and that uh, we would be calling for a uh, board meeting that afternoon, by teleconference, of course. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, but Mr Macdonald didn't go to, he, he didn't attend the board meeting? No, he didn't attend the board meeting. It was a director's only meeting. And you gave him he, he, your notes so that he can... Could as, as per normal minutes. with non-director's uh, only meeting, as I gave evidence last time, we, I, I give a summary of the critical issues that needed to be uh, recorded for the minutes. Those minutes are then presented, usually at the next meeting, to the directors. You, you don't give the minutes to, you don't distribute the minutes prior to the meeting? Yes, so they, that are, people, they are yeah. distributed prior to the meeting, but at the next meeting, the board then has a re, an opportunity to reflect on the minutes as they've been recorded, on my memory, and the directors then have an opportunity to either add, subtract, or correct anything. Mr uh, Nutt, did you add anything to those board minutes um, that reflected your conversations with Ms Holgate? Uh, yes. Mr. So they were in the minutes. My question was for Mr Nutt. I'm sorry. So I apologise, Senator. Can you just... Um, so I asked if you had added anything to the draft minutes, as they would be at that point, that reflected your discussions with Ms Holgate? No. No. And in the board, as we've discussed, Mr Nutt, in the, in the minutes, it wasn't minuted that you had been given authority by the board to interact with Ms Holgate? No. Mr Macdonald, I think I've asked you this before, but are you able to table those board minutes? And I think you last said to me that you were going to think about it, but have you thought about it? Uh, the minute, sorry, Nick Macdonald, Australia, what's the yes, Yeah, can we shuffle chairs so we've got people maybe at Mr. the Mac table? Maybe Mr McIver, I might need you, Mr Nutt. Maybe Mr McIver can go. Uh, thank you, Senator. So. Uh, the minutes of the 22nd, oh sorry, Nick McDonald, General Counsel and Corporate Secretary, Australia Post. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Senator. The minutes for the meeting on the 22nd of October have been tabled to this inquiry. But when? I when think it was on the last Okay, occasion. you've got, so all of them, have you, so uh, have we got all of your board meeting minutes? No, you've got the minutes for the 22nd of October. Of the 22nd. Can we have the minutes of the next, of the meeting after that? Uh, I believe we took that on notice, and the response yes. to that is due on the seventh of May. But you're here do you now. think you do you think you're going to? Do you think you could table them? Uh, so the subsequent meeting was on the twenty third of October, uh, and that dealt. Oh, sorry. We know. Sorry. We know who you are. There now. we go. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Sorry. So the subsequent meeting was the twenty third of October. That dealt with a number of matters uh, that were part of the board's usual. Uh, could you, redact those? could you so, redact those out? Y yes, we could prepare a copy of the minutes with irrelevant content, yeah. content redacted that uh, and only the relevant content remaining. Okay, thanks. so you're going to do that we and we'll get that before the 7th? Uh, well, yes, we will do that. Good, uh, okay, thank you. Promptly. Um, now, the Minister for Communications has suggested the Prime Minister walked into some carefully laid question time trap where Labor somehow put words into his mouth and then forced the Prime Minister to say that if the CEO doesn't step aside, she can go. So I want to go very carefully through the timeline of events that day. Um, now, I can read, if people are unfamiliar with what the Prime Minister said uh, in that question time, but then I'll read parts of it. But um, So he said, and so immediately I spoke with the shareholding minister, the Minister for Finance, and the Minister, the minister for Finance, actually a former flatmate of Mr Ronaldson's. Very interesting. And the Minister responsible, the Minister for Communication, Cyber Safety and the Arts. And from those discussions, the following actions ensued. That there had to be an independent investigation done by the department, not by Australia Post, that the Chief Executive should stand aside immediately. The Prime Minister continued, this all happened within an hour, blah, 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 blah. I can read all of it if people want. But essentially what I want to know is we know from the evidence and the phone calls provided to this committee Minister Fletcher spoke with you, Mr. DiBartolomeo, at 1.09 and 1.35, or was it 1.31, but whatever, around then. And on both occasions said the government wanted Ms. Holgate stood down. Call records show that you called Ms. Holgate after each of these calls, but we were not aware that you again called the minister at 1.44 p.m. This call was to advise that Ms. Holgate was not agreeing to step aside. So when, you, when we looked at the call records, there was an additional phone call from you, there but was. do you re recall that? Okay, yeah, good. There was. Um, the Prime Minister's office were then advised that Ms Holgate did not want to step aside and this all happened before question time. Uh, 
145, certainly before question time. Yeah. Um, the government's position that it wanted Ms Holgate to stand down occurred nearly two hours before the Prime Minister received a question about Australia Post in question time at 2.40. So all of that, you were aware of the government's position about wanting Ms Holgate to stand down? Yes. So in fact, people suggesting well, actually, I'll go on with a series of questions. The government was fully informed before question time that Ms Holgate was not agreeing to stand aside. Um, I, I believe I shared that information with the minister. OK. Mm -hmm. um, what the Prime Minister said in question time was not a spur of the moment brain snap, was it? He said exactly what he planned to say. I have no idea what... Well, it would seem if they knew... In what? question time, the question the Prime Minister received was not even about the CEO. He was actually asked a question about the Board of Australia Post. Why did the Prime Minister proceed to deliver a premeditated statement that if the CEO didn't stand aside, she could go? I have no idea. Oh, I want to ask you, um, Mr De Bartolomeo, when did the internal audit report move from the chair to the CEO? You have an internal audit report. Ah, uh, yes, that would have been one of the actions that we took. Um, so it moved to the CEO, to the CEO from the chair. Um, if I, Jan West, if I, if I can just clarify, when you well, say internal. So my audit. understanding is that the internal audit report function Jan. used to go to the chair. Jan, Jan is the chair. I'm the chair of the audit risk committee. The internal audit function but, yeah. reports through. Um, functionally to the CFO, <coughs> right. but on all matters <coughs> relating to audit to me. So, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's internal my, audit. Yes, yes. Yeah. So my understanding was that the head of the internal audit function used to report to the chair. It didn't go through the CFO or the CEO. Not to my recollection. It's been no. in that but when Mr. Stanhope is this comes. The old culture we're talking about. Yes, the old culture where, in fact, there was a more direct line and a better reporting system. I think. But Mr Stanhope is coming, so I'll ask him. Um, but you're currently the CFO reports to you, is that correct? No. Internal audit, which is a separate yes. control function, second line, third line of defence within, within the control function, reports to the CFO on an administrative functional yes. basis, but for all matters relating to audit findings, yes, to me. So the, so, so the Head of Internal Audit reports to you? On all matters relating to audit, yes. OK. And so what happens when it goes, when that person goes to the CFO? Does he, does he also, is there a dotted the line to the, yeah. is it? it, it that, that, that's in the, in the basis that they're an employee. Um, you know, I'm a, so I'm they're, in the, they're in the team of the CFO? The internal function is part of the CFO team, effectively, yes. Sure. Perhaps okay. if I could assist yes, with that. Yes, because group. I can see that if you were the CFO, and you're the CFO, remember where you've had to change this, where the CFO and the CEO are in a very cosy relationship approving each other's expenses. Mm. I can see that if you're the internal audit person and you're going to the CFO, I can see some of that, mm. you know, me maybe being, you know, not, I'm not saying let's you're... Get, let's Mr. Mr McDonald, can you clarify this for us? Yes, I was just going to assist by reference to the, uh, the Charter of the Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, so what that provides for is that uh, the General Manager of Internal Audit, who leads that function, uh, reports on a day-to-day -day basis to the Group Chief Financial Officer, and that role is directly accountable to the Chairman of the Committee, Jan West. Uh, the Charter also provides that the Committee participates in the appointment, dismissal and replacement of that role. So, so can I that just clarify? committee plays an important role in monitoring so can that you, Are you function. able to table that? Could you table uh, that policy document? That, that, we can table that, that Charter, and in fact, it's on our and website. And how, how are my other policy documents going that are in the CEO's contract that I asked you about? Uh, we are compiling those documents in order to respond to that uh, request okay, as well. Um, so can I, can I just clarify the head of the, inter the internal audit report? It, that person reports to the CFO. Yes. And that's the <coughs> CFO, but does, does that person also report to you, Ms West? Yes. Okay. Separately? So, so not when, when, I, when we talk about functionally, annual leave, remuneration, you know, completion gifts. of... Gifts. Credit card expenses. Sorry? Gifts. Uh, gifts. I don't know that internal audit would be involved in 
Well, who, does the the who does the credit card statements issue? When you say do the credit card statements? Who looks after the credit card statements? You know, um, make sure they're correct. That's okay. within the finance function. Okay. Reconciles and, them. Yeah, look, make, as, as a member of the board, I'm not involved no, in the you, detail you're, you're of the actual process. You're not going through a calculator and a highlighter, are you? But it, the, the approval of um, and the processing of credit card system is, is part of the finance mm. financial system. Mm. Well, that's how it's delegated round. You know, I, I would, yeah. we would need to take that well, on notice. Boy, Mr. Boyes told me that he was unable in a question on notice, a response to a question on notice, told me he was unable to answer wow. my questions around that because of coronavirus. I mean, in the same response to questions on notice, he also confirmed that all of the you know thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of flowers were still going into offices, but he couldn't answer a question about credit cards. Um, so I just so okay. So Senator I'm going to leave. Kitching, that, but can I have, have a to can go I, to other senators? Yes. So. Can I ask Mr. McDonald to give me sort of the position description of the internal audit? I just want to see what the internal audit person is doing. We'll take that on notice, Senator. Thank, Thank you. Oh, well, do you think you can? Well, we'll see if we can make some inquiries okay. in the background. Yep. Uh, we we'll, can certainly get the charter to you quickly. Th Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Oh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for appearing in person, everyone. Um, the ABC Radio's Life Matters uh, on the 27th of April discussed the impact um, of banks leaving. It was an issue discussed in the BCG report, the potential opportunity, obviously, for Australia Post. Um, one of the things that rural and regional communities are very, very thankful for, for your organisation and for Ms Holgate's leadership, is the negotiation of the Bank at Post deal. Um, what is the current state of the Bank at Post deal? Uh, the current Bank at Post deal is, is still uh, valid and negotiations are currently underway for the purpose of renewing it. I'm not sure of the exact details. Obviously, as a board, we're not involved in those negotiations, but uh, the intent is to renew those. The intent deals. is to renew, so Absolutely. you can guarantee, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, yes, we've got the substantive issues, we've also got this inquiry and Ms Holgate's exit um, causing a lot of angst out in communities. Um, so to hear the board last week um, stand up for rural and regional Australia, especially Mr MacGyver, um, but also <coughs> the Bank at Post deal and your commitment to renegotiating that Absolutely. deal. Absolutely. And, and those, my understanding, those negotiations are taking place and there's nothing untoward coming out that uh, warrants any concern on that front. Um, we've heard a lot about core business. We know we've got the Cobb & Co Australia Post Act, uh, where we get a letter every day. We probably have to you know, have a convoluted process to put a, stamp, a price on a stamp. Um, we are in the 21st century. Um, what discussions are the board having around increasing the scope of core business for Australia Post to include parcels? Parcels is our core business today. Certainly our regulatory environment puts letters front and centre. Correct. That, that, that has been our historic uh, reason for being. Mm, mm. Uh, but as I said in my opening statement, those letter volumes are declining at a fast rate, certainly over the last decade, accelerated dramatically last year because of COVID. Our parcel business has been growing, again, because of COVID accelerated dramatically last year. To put it in perspective, something like 300 million letters less delivered last year than the prior year. 100 million additional parcels delivered more. So than the, the growth prior year. is on the parcel side. Growth is on the parcel side. And 80%, mostly made up of uh, parcels, let me say, of our revenue is revenue that we we gain in the competitive marketplace. In other words, we don't have a monopoly. Mm. We, ha we are competing in the commercial space. So our focus has been for some time and further reinforced uh, at the moment, given the acceleration of these trends, to ensure we have a viable, profitable, successful parcel business. That's good news. So um, when, when the government, the shareholder ministers commissioned the BCG review, and one of the terms of reference was the regulatory environment that Australia Post um, operates within, um, was there any discussion or um, suggestions that we should be updating the regulate, 
regulatory environment you operate in to include your everyday core business as of the 21st century? And if not, why not? Um, the discussions I had with the minister certainly didn't go to that detail. Uh, the primary driver, as he was, and, and you might recall, I was a, announced as the new chair yes. at the same time that this. Yes. I and, had the and my discussions with the minister had been primarily around the focus of we want to ensure the financial long term sustainability <coughs> of Australia Post uh, to ensure it's able to meet its CSO obligation. Community but there was no obligation. discussion about changing the CSO. But no, none of that detail. All right. What they. The terms of reference that we got didn't go to that detail either. Whether they, BCG were given more details as to what they were after, I don't know. It, it wasn't our commission. Okay. Well, I, I think the evidence today has been very clear that that's something we need to address. I just want to go to some um, evidence by the department um, last week. Um, we basically said all uh, GBEs, the Commonwealth entities and companies, the policies for the expenditure of public money are governed by the PGPA Act, and then it is up to the accountable authorities, in this case the boards, to set the policies within the organisations in respect to expenditure. So boards themselves are responsible for keeping the organisation's expenditure in line with the PGPA Act. It's not actually the CEO, it's the board's responsibility to assure, ensure the policies are in place and the compliance with those policies. That's the evidence the department gave uh, yesterday. I would like uh, confirmation from the Australian board that that's your understanding of, of the operation. That is the understanding of the board's Mr operation. Nutt? Uh, well, um, the wording, sorry, I don't mean to cheese pair, was uh, the, there's an act and a whole legislative regime, regulatory yep. regime. Yes, as the chair's just indicated, the board sets the policies, but the uh, obligation is uh, the principal legislation and the regulations don't disappear because the board sets policy. So it sets a, an environment and the CEO and the other staff respond to that environment. Bear in mind the CEO themselves are on the board. So yeah, I'm, I'm not so trying to be I'm probably I'm going to, to the department's own advice last week, which seems in contradiction to, you know, maybe I just need clarity. Um, the governance and oversight requirements, this is a quote from the department, for government businesses enterprise require the boards to put in place codes of conduct, in particular that govern, among other things, expenditure on gifts and received gifts and benefits for employees within the organisation. So you're all nodding. Uh, it's the board's responsibility to make sure the appropriate policies are in place and that they're complied with. That's why I think it's important to clarify what the Maddox report actually did say around this particular issue in Finding 9, that yes, it did say the purchase of the watches were inconsistent with obligations imposed by the PGP Act, but then it very clearly across the page says the absence of a clearly identifiable and directly applicable policy, authorisation, direction, etc., um, by the board for the CEO was actually the cause. Um, so whilst there was a technical breach of the PGPA Act, it was actually related back to the failure of there being appropriate policies in place for the CEO to follow and a compliance regime. I need some... If I, may. I, would, I would love you to respond to the department's... Um, Evidence. Well, first of all, I support what the department says about the fact that the board ultimately has to put in place the structure of policies and procedures that govern how we spend our money. So, Mr. Di Bartolomeo, is can this I, the failure of the Australia can, Post board? Sorry, can I answer the question? I will get to that. Um, clearly, uh, there were policies and procedures about how to, including on gifts and, and, and rewards for staff. Uh, the policy did not either rule out or rule in gifts like... Was silent. The, was silent on that. Hmm. We, we have given well, evidence... It, I in have the words of the Maddox report, it was absent. <clears throat> I've given evidence that, as part of the review, that, w that was not only conducted by them but by us when this came out, was whether all our policies and procedures were as, as fulsome as they could be. And I gave evidence and I think we've, we've, yep. support, we've given the information 
32 actions yes. were taken uh, that enhance those board's obligations. One of them, for instance, if I could pick an example that relates to the chair, was that in fact the CEO's expenses should be approved by the chair, uh, which is normal, normal practice for myself and, and other boards that I chair. In, in Australia Post, the practice had been that the CEO's expenses were approved by the CFO. Yes, inappropriate. We've, we've got this evidence. It, but there right. has been a lack of clarity about where the responsibility lay. Um, and it actually took Ms Holgate to lose her job for the board to become aware of the failure around its responsibility to put these sort of policies and compliance regimes in place. Because we're let, talking let, let two me correct, years Let me later. correct that. Let me correct that. We started taking action on those things well before the resignation letter on the 2nd of November. In when fact, did you start taking action? Almost immediately. The 23rd? Of? October. The next oh, no, day. No, no, no. And when were the watches purchased? Oh, they were purchased back in 2018. That's my point. That is my point. It's only because somebody was stood down. It was because she lost her job that you bothered to no. look over your responsibilities I'm under sorry, the I'm sorry, she did not lose the job AAC when we started doing that. And these watches were purchased two years ago, and in Mr Nutt's own words, uh, if, if he had been running the show, it would never have happened. So the board failed in its obligations under the PGPE Act to set up a regime that would seen this never to have happened and for Ms Holgate to have never had to go through this. Is there a question? No, there's no question. Thanks, Mr. Uh, thanks Senator McKenzie. Um, there was an adverse finding made against the board by the Maddox report. Yes. Sorry, could you please refer to which part of the report? I think it's, it's fi nine. finding nine. Finding nine, part A, B, C and D. So everyone's very cute and they quote the the purchase of the cardio watches was in inconsistent with the PGP A Act. Turn the page. Then Mr. McDonald, you so, weren't aware of that finding? No, so what I wanted no, to you add weren't was aware hang, of hang on, hang Sorry. on, hang on. I'm not sure that's that's a fair, yes, that's, fair representation. That's not Mr. What I McDonald, said. are you aware of this finding? I'm aware of that finding, okay. but what I was seeking to do was clarify the way in which it was being referred to. So paragraph A talks about the absence of a clearly identifiable and directly mm -hmm. applicable mm -hmm. policy issued by the board that supported the expenditure. That's related to finding seven that also talks about the board not having issued a reward or recognition policy that would support mm -hmm. reward or recognition of executive Sorry. performance through the provision of watches. So, didn't say it wasn't so, able to so there, was a, there was not a policy that explicitly supported the purchase of watches for the purposes of reward. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of the work that's been done subsequently, the 32 actions and work subsequently, there is now a reward and recognition mm -hmm. policy that is explicit about the limit uh, Mr. Mr. of Mr. an McDonald, amount payable as a reward. Mr McDonald, has the full board been educated on the failures? Well, the board has undertaken training on the PGPA Act, which was one of the requirements uh, from our shareholder departments following the report by Maddox. Mm -hmm. um, could I ask, and then I'm going to go to Senator Hanson, um, uh, Christine Holgate has, um, there's been a press release released uh, this afternoon in relation to uh, potential legal action that Christine Holgate um, may take against both the board and the shareholder ministers. Um, this statement, I assume you've seen it, Mr I Chairman? Have seen, I have seen a statement. Great, okay, so we, we, we can talk uh, to the statement then. Um, what is, why have we got to this point uh, Ms Holgate was asking for mediation with the board. Um, that hasn't been forthcoming. Well, I'm sorry, we have received a request for mediation. We've responded in the first instance to say we would be pleased to undertake a mediation. Um, they, however, have jumped to, okay, we could have the mediation commencing last Friday, last Saturday or today. And we said, look, this is unreasonable. We will deal with the mediation by all means, but they've been very cute about trying to... Uh, we only got advice of the mediation request. Yeah, so look, perhaps if I can assist with the timeline. So yeah. uh, correspondence uh, proposing a mediation was first received from Ms Holgate's lawyers on the 21st of April, a Wednesday. On the following Monday, our lawyers responded accepting that invitation to mediate. 
On the 27th of April, we had the second day of this hearing. On the 28th of April, uh, further correspondence was received from Ms Holgate's lawyers. Uh, it proposed a mediation, as the chair referred to, on the following Friday. Saturday was, in fact, the Tuesday, not today. Uh, so effectively, in a matter of days. Uh, obviously, the third day of this hearing is today, uh, which is in amongst those dates. Uh, our lawyers responded on the 29th of April, uh, repeating that we were willing to participate in a mediation, but noting that it would be necessary for the parties to be properly prepared and advised in order to do that, that the parties would need to agree upon the mediator, would need to agree upon the <coughs> location, uh, the scope, attendees, and also the timetable for exchanging position papers. Uh, our board needs to be properly advised. We need an opportunity to brief council to appear at the mediation, as is Ms Holgate's lawyers. Did you, and offer, did you offer alternate dates yourself? Uh, what we did is we responded saying that we were willing to participate in the mediation and we would respond shortly but that could mean on with the our never view never. on all of those matters. That could mean on the never-never. So uh, did you, sorry, you didn't Senator give any, you didn't give any hang, dates, sorry, mate, even towards the, the next... Hang, hang on, let the witness finish. Yeah, perhaps I can finish the timeline. So uh, Ms Holgate's lawyers responded on the 30th of April, Friday mm -hmm. night at 10.22pm, requesting a response by Sunday at midday. Mm -hmm. uh, our lawyers responded on Sunday at 8.19am, reiterating that we were prepared to participate in the mediation, but making the point that everybody needed to be properly prepared. That's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. common sense for the mediation mm -hmm. to be okay. productive. Okay, Mr McDonald. So just to be clear, and I'd like um, this a question, I think, for the, for the chairman as, and the board, as opposed to um, uh, you know, your assistance. Um, Mr Chairman, so you're, you're, you are willing and uh, prepared to enter into mediation with Ms Holgate? We are willing and we wish to prepare. At this stage, we don't, don't even know the details of what the claims are, but that's part of the process that we're happy to go into. Mm -hmm. There's no debate here about wanting to mediate. We're, we're happy to do mm -hmm. that. But the timeline that they've been put sure. up to date just simply been unreasonable. That's sure. But sure. we'll go at it ASAP. Mm. Um, surely it would be a matter of wanting to uh, deal with this as swiftly as possible. Absolutely. For everybody's sake. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, could I just ask in relation to this, have you had any uh, communications from uh, any of the shareholder ministers or their officers in relation to this, uh, uh, these le pending legal proceedings? Um, well, the original letter for litigation uh, was actually sent to the two shareholder ministers and myself. Mm -hmm. So I did obviously talk to the shareholder ministers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I advised them that we would be responding in, a, in, a, in an affirmative that we mm -hmm. would take on and, uh, and, and advise them of that, that fact. Right. And the ministers uh, uh, haven't responded in an affirmative I'm, manner thus far? I, I'm not aware. Well, look, and look, I think perhaps that's a question best asked of the ministers. We, yeah, of we can't really speak, speak for them. Of course. Uh, um, okay, but you have been in, in communications with the minister's offices. Uh, given that we uh, received the, the same the same letter, sure. yes. Have you spoken to the to either minister directly in relation to this? Uh, only one of the ministers. And which minister is that? Minister uh, Fletcher. Mr. Fletcher. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, I'm quite impressed that um, you're talking about public <coughs> expectation. That I think each and every one of you said that if you you would not have. Um, allowed for the watches to have been bought. You, you think it's against <coughs> public expectation, a waste of public monies, $20,000 we're talking about. And you all agree with that? You would not have approved the buying of the watches? I've made that statement before. Right. And so has Miss West mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. last comment. Mm -hmm. And everyone said that. Fine. Then can you explain to me and the public what the Isaac Awards are? I'm sorry. The Isaac Awards. Um, I, I, I'm not fully a fan with them, but they are oh, recognition really? of, but they are recognition of the good work of a, a, our um, our post offices and uh, the LPAs in particular. Right, and I understand that your corporate secretary, Mr. Macdonald, attended last week on the 28th of April. They were held last Wednesday night. That's correct. In Adelaide. I, I attended in Adelaide. The yes. awards were held across a number of locations right. linked by video. And that's right. It's held in the capital cities, isn't it? Oh, well, in five of them. It yes. was beamed across Australia as well, wasn't it? 
I don't know whether it was beamed across Australia. It was well, my leaked by it video was. between those five locations. So it's a black tie dinner, isn't it, for for the organisation, for the executives, and for the employees of Australia Post? Uh, it was not a black tie dinner. Uh, I think it was so, cocktail dress with a touch of red. Oh, so it was at the um, the Australia Plaza Post Ballroom at the Paris end of Collins Street, in Melbourne, which is five or six star, isn't it? Look black tie. Black tie well, dinner. it was not black tie. Uh, oh, Mr. Mr. I wore a suit. Well, for many a uh, difference right. between a cocktail and a black tie. Mr. McDonald, yeah. uh, you were there. To answer your question, I, I, was, I was not at the Melbourne venue, so I'm not sure which venue it was I didn't at. say Thank Melbourne. You. I said you were at Adelaide. That's right. But you asked me about the Melbourne venue and comment. No, I didn't mention. I said Plaza there was Ball one Street. at the Plaza. You said it wasn't really black tie or anything. If you're going to have it at the Plaza Ballroom, which is the Paris end of Collins really Street, that is not. Anyway, it was held at cities around Australia at a cost of half a million dollars to the Australian taxpayer. Correct? I don't know. I don't know how much it costs, but we can take that question on notice. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Did you know of it? Did you attend? And I want to know, apart from Mr McDonald, how many of the directors attended those functions? I didn't attend this year's function. I attended last year's, but I didn't attend this year's. Did you approve it or were you aware of what it cost the taxpayers? I didn't specifically approve it and I don't know the exact details of the costs. No. You didn't specifically approve of it? I'm is that what you said? Or it, sorry, I, 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 I didn't approve it. I didn't approve it. Okay. You sorry. did approve it. No, I didn't personally approve it. Not personally, but as a board. You, w you knew it was going to happen. The board must know that you're going to spend that sort of it, money it, on a function. It but is an annual, an annual event right. that has been ongoing for some time mm -hmm. and, and it is appropriately uh, managed to recognise and reward good performance. Half a Ra million dollars to taxpayers. Is that the public expectation? That was your word today. Public expectation, $20,000 on watches. And the CEO, she gets thrown under a bus and she loses her job over $20,000. Well, I wonder what the Prime Minister is going to say about the board spending half a million dollars on this gala event. On a cocktail party. Uh, on a cocktail party. Perhaps. So I just yes. wonder yeah. what the Prime Minister yes. is going to say about this. No, I wonder no, how no, you'll Perhaps Miss West might be able to uh, I, I, give I'd us like, some information I'd like to here. Comment because Head I of the auditing committee. No, no. As a, as a director, I attended the last year's function with the chairman yep. in Melbourne. It was not a black tie event. It was postal workers, posties, post offices, posties, celebrating their success over and the years. And executives. Oh, a and executives. <coughs> no, Ms. West, there, don't there, was dress sample, it down. there was a sample number, and I can assure you it's more in the nature of work for the executives than celebration. Um, so the, so the, the, oh, you're, the, the you winners, your, the winners and the awardees are the hardworking posties and LPO workers. Um, my recollection is they, they came from various parts of rural Australia, if we're focusing on rural Australia. Oh, yeah. um, and it is a very significant event for those people. They love to get dressed up, and they did. Oh. Ms. West, we didn't. went like this. Could you take on notice did. and just give us a sort of an overall cost of the function? It will be, it will, and, I, and that needs to go to a management issue, but it, it will be part of the um, the whole post office network, postal delivery, and customer can, service, me, hang on. customer service function, part of their budget, which is huge. But yes, thank you. Yeah, so I'm sure I'll Mr. McDonald can assist that. Yeah, we Sen can take that on notice. Senator Hanson. Mr. McDonald, you actually presented um, flowers to not a postie, but uh, the executive general manager, um, <coughs> Nicole Sheffield. That's uh, correct, isn't it? That's not correct. I, I was in Adelaide and Nicole Sheffield was in Melbourne. Did you make a comment that um, um, you, so you didn't present any flowers no, to I did Ms not. Sheffield? No. Did you make comment on the night saying um, in a skit that I'll take that on notice? No, I did not. There was no skit on the night that I was involved in. There were Did you make the comments then that I will take that on notice? No, I did not. 
I was asked about appearing at Senate Estimates because people had seen me on television, uh, which is not where I usually appear. Uh, and I was asked about that experience and I said that uh, it was, um, you get questions on all sorts of things. I gave some examples, but I didn't say I would take that on notice. I've also <laughs> been told that um, uh, these awards, LPOs and posties are not invited. Well, I was sitting I'm on a table with. Understanding who I met last year. I was sitting on a table with people from the Berry Post Office. The, there were people in Perth from the Kununurra Post Office that won an award. I mean, these were all people that work in our postal network and were celebrating their achievements. Right. Hearing different stories about it. Oh, look, I want to, and it's very important for time, so we're going to keep this. Mr. Lucio, you have the phone records here, and you state that you were actually on the phone with Miss Holgate at 5:50 on the 22nd of October. That's what my phone records say, and I do recall that call. Yeah, but she sent um, Mr. Nutter an um, email at 5:49, and she sent you an email at 5:53. Your telephone call by your records went for four minutes and 25 seconds. How could she be actually writing and sending you an email saying that she is actually going to be um, taking two weeks annual leave when she's supposed to be on the phone to you for four minutes 25? That doesn't add up. Well, it does add up. She did send me an email and it was about taking two weeks annual leave and we discussed it over the phone as I received the email. So yep. when she prepared it, when she sent it, I don't know. I know when I received it. And, and I specifically had a conversation with her. And I've, I've given this evidence already, so I'm not coming up with new evidence. But the conversation went along the lines, Christine, taking two weeks leave is not going to solve the issue, given that the inquiry is going to go for four weeks. And secondly, why do you want to clear your leave when, in fact, you can, you, you can stand aside, be paid fully, and deal with the matters pertaining to the inquiry. And Mr. I, I Barnes, had that conversation with I'll put it to you that you actually tried to ring Miss um, Holgate mm. while she was in that car journey from Canberra to Sydney and yes. she was with Sue Davies. Yes. She couldn't take your call because she was actually communicating with, with Mr Nutt. So therefore when Christine phoned back, it wasn't, it was on her phone but it was Sue Davies that had the conversation with you, not Christine Holgate, because at the time she was still con communicating with Mr Nutt through the emails. As Senator, these are the assertions you made at the last committee yes. meeting, and I said to you and that's not the case. Two I did speak. I did speak to Christine Holgate on her phone, and we spoke about the issues at hand. Is it's it fair to say, Mr Chairman, that in that conversation? Yes. You were putting the proposition that two weeks' leave wasn't going to be sufficient. Yes. And Miss Holgate was holding the line that she wanted her two weeks' leave and would be prepared to, to send out a statement saying that. I, I said uh, right again from the start of these hearings that my conversations with Christine Holgate directly on the phone. Uh, she, was, she was reluctant. There's no denying that. She was reluctant to stand aside. She wanted to stay in the role and the job. Then, after persuasion, saying, look, it would not be appropriate for her to be in the job while the inquiry was taking place. And then her next comeback was, well, what about the two weeks' leave? And again, I said, two weeks is not enough. Four weeks is required. And why take leave when we can pay you on, on our time. Is that, is that because that would impact on her entitlements if she was required to take well, yeah, leave? Yeah, it was clearing her leave. So she would have a, there'd be a financial detriment well, if she was Well, it would have been to her to financial okay. detriment. If, Mr. Hang, so, on, hang, on, hang on a second. And, and, and the end point, albeit reluctantly, I agree, was that she agreed to stand aside. And this was agreed to- On that telephone to, conversation? Was it on that telephone conversation? Yes, it was, before the six o'clock meeting, because I was then able to go back to the six o'clock, uh, the recommencement of the meeting at six o'clock, and advise the board accordingly. And then we prepared all the documentation along those lines. Mm. And then I'll put it, it to you that Miss Davies and her evidence said that she was sitting beside Miss Holgate in the car and never heard Miss Holgate agree to stand aside. And that was Sue Davies. Um, evidence and Christine Holgate's evidence. So there's two evidence there that 
is no, not hold on. I heard, I heard Sue Davis's All evidence right. also. What she said was that she didn't hear Christine Holgate say, I, I agree to stand aside, but she didn't hear anything different to the evidence I gave. She, 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 she could barely hear <clears throat> the conversation. In fact, they were both often on the phone talking to whoever they're on the phone, facing the opposite direction in the car because it was noisy and it was difficult to I mean, hear their own this conversation. Chairman, isn't, this why, isn't this precisely why, isn't this precisely why as chairperson of this board, in the midst of this frenetic yes. afternoon, you could have taken a breath, waited 24 hours and actually had a rational, reasonable, calm conversation with the people involved. This is what strikes me as incredibly strange, that the Prime Minister does what he does, he flies off the handle, the board had no other option but to respond. And while Christine Holgate is refusing to, st <laughs> to step down, you had to push her to a point where it was inevitable. And you had nothing in writing. And you had nothing in writing. You, have, you, you haven't managed this calmly and rationally may, at all. May I respond, Senator? Would you, oh, this is my question to you. Okay. If you had this over again, would you at least taken a breath stepped back and dealt with this calmly and rationally? I believe while it was certainly hectic that afternoon, we did discuss it calmly and rationally. We weren't in the shouting match, not, with Senate, not, not between Christine Holgate and myself. It was being discussed. Yes, I do agree. She, she was reluctant to stand aside. Um, and, and she it's saw that enough. somehow this was potentially impacting on her. We said, look, this is simply a means to get to the end. The end for us was her to get through this investigation and have her come back in the role. That was our objective. She did agree. We then produced a number of documentations that we mailed, emailed to her. Uh, and in fact, all the discussions on documentation that occurred between us did not in any way dispute the notion of her standing aside. It was only some five or six days later that the, the question came back that she didn't stand aside. So it was rational and calm at the time. But you didn't even get and advice. You didn't even get no, advice. We, we didn't need advice. We were asking our CEO to stand aside. You didn't need advice on that? Can I ask really? you a couple of well, questions, yes. please? <clears throat> Sorry. Really? Did someone, did anyone mm, at the board meeting... Yeah, yeah. Well, we will, come, we will come back to you, Senator Hanson. Let's just get this question. Did anyone at the board meeting... Now, I presume there are people with legal qualifications. Did anyone say, maybe we should get this in writing? Uh, no, we didn't ask if we, we could get it in writing, but we so did... So now put, you've got two... No, uh, hang, hang that on. afternoon. But we did follow up with a number of documentations that put that premise in writing. So, Mr Macdonald, was Mr De Bartolomeo no, relying, no. almost sort of relying on a postal acceptance rule? Is that what he was relying on? Sorry, perhaps if I can add to well, that. So, so, so uh, you, the, you sent documents which... So we've, we've, did it say you're standing aside? What did, so what did the documents say? Yes, so I think we've previously given evidence that on the 23rd of October the board uh, requested some advice on documenting that arrangement. Uh, in correspondence with Ms Holgate, uh, and that that correspondence was sent on the 25th of October, uh, which referred to the standing aside and the other practical arrangements that would operate during that time. Uh, there were also <coughs> the other contemporaneous documents, the statement that was issued uh, and the, the two emails that had been referred to earlier, the 23rd of October and how did in the you morning and the 25th of October on did the you, weekend. Did you post, express post these documents? Did you email them? Did you know that she was monitoring, expecting to be monitoring her email in order to receive the documents? How did you ensure that she saw the documents? OK, if we deal with the various documents, there was the letter that I mentioned, the correspondence recording the standing aside and those arrangements. Uh, that was sent by Sue Davies to Christine Holgate. I'm not sure exactly of the method. Is this all um, in we evidence? We can take this on notice. This, well, this is we're going to go back. Messy. We, we are going to go very messy. We are going to go back no. to Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson, you have the call. Thank you, call. Mr. De Bartolomeo. Lucia. If you having Lucia, can That's I call you Lucia? Right. Thank you. If you had a telephone conversation with Miss Holgate at five fifty, she's and that went for four minutes twenty five seconds, 
And she sends you a phone, an email at 5.53. She's pretty, pretty good at doing that then, right, typing you an email. And during that kind of phone, telephone conversation, you supposedly have convinced her that she will stand aside. Why didn't she put it in the email? I think she had the email ready beforehand. Um, we spoke about it. We re I received what it. Was it. What was in that email that she sent out to you at 5.53? What did it say? Uh, basically seeking two weeks' leave. Right. She also sent an email to Mr Nutt at 6.03 and 6.41. The same advice. <coughs> I have done nothing wrong. I am seeking to have two weeks annual leave. She's spoken to the chair and she wants to take two weeks annual leave. At no point did she tell Mr Nutt that she had agreed with you to stand aside. Now, I'd like to know at what point, Miss West, you might be able to answer this, what point did Mr Nutt tell you of Christine Holgate's emails to him that she, she did not want to stand down, that she wanted two weeks leave at that board meeting? <coughs> During the course of the afternoon, because I think Mr Nutt has, has already um, reported that she had indicated the two week the preference for two week leave, two right. weeks leave during the course of the afternoon. Were you aware of the emails to Mr. Nutt at six oh three and six forty one? I certainly wasn't. In fact, you asked me this question last week, and and I had said that I, I wasn't aware of those emails. You weren't. I said our meeting had finished at six twenty, so the Correct. meetings at six forty one, we minutes were that the emails we wouldn't have been aware of anyway. No, so if your meeting finishes at 6.20, at no point did Mr Nutt say, I'm sorry, Christine Olgate is not going to stand down. She wants two weeks annual well, leave. I, so that I wasn't discussed. Was that, that discussed with the board at any time? Was that discussed with the board of her, how she, what she her position was. wanted to, what she wanted to do? Not, not after the chairman reported that, that she had agreed to stand aside. So you've taken his word for it. There was no yeah. evidence of it. It was just a verbal thing, but everything else was in writing, especially to Mr Nutt, continually saying, I will take two weeks and you'll leave. So that's it. Well, we weren't aware that the, the ongoing two weeks annual leave right. situation, the assumption is that the chairman has advised us and yep. working relationship, we totally trust what Ten days la afterwards on the resignation letter, which was accepted by the, by the chair. By the board. By the, by the board. By the you board. accepted? Yes. Right. But West, you, knew you, know, that you, didn't, you didn't decide to communicate with other board members Can once I... you got a, once you received documents for or whatever you received from Ms Holgate? So, sorry. so Ms West didn't know. When did Ms so West... Which, which documents so are you talking about? Yeah. The 640... I don't want to interrupt Senator Hanson, oh, which I am. Um, but when did you know... So you received it 640? No, I didn't. You didn't? <coughs> what? They didn't receive anything. What? what? The, I don't know where your line of questioning is going. Let's, let's, yeah, you can, well, I want to ask, I want to ask when did the board directors, because when I asked Mr Nutt earlier in the day, Mr Nutt demurred from answering in the affirmative that board directors should actually all act with the same knowledge. And it seems to me that you've got lots of board directors acting with different levels of knowledge. You've got Mr Macdonald with some knowledge, he's not on the board, but does the minutes. But you have different, you can't, operate like this. And I hope that this is one of the 32 recommendations you've done. You've got people acting with different levels of knowledge at different times. You've got you what? and Mr Nutt having different conversations with Ms Holgate. Okay, we're, back we're, to Senator Hanson, please. That can what I would like to know, the letter of resignation that came... Yes. This is the 2nd of November now. On the... Um, what date? 2nd of November. Right. At 10.46am. That's it. That's it. Right. We agree. Then you actually sent it on to the minister at 11.45? I advised the minister whether I sent it to advised him. Advised the minister? Know, but certainly well, they, they've had a copy of it because that okay. got out to the media at 1.30. Well, uh, that, that's not quite right, but nevertheless. Well, it is. It was on Sky. That wasn't News at 1.30. There was, there was, there was nothing on Sky at 1.30. It was at 2.03 that Sky started talking about it. That was Minister Fletcher's office. Well, someone's put it out, and you sent that letter, and the letter of resignation the other. It wasn't us, and no, I gave that evidence at the last did, meeting. But just to be clear, and we have had this you evidence had already, yes. that you gave that you gave the resignation letter and information to the minister's office. Yes. I, look, I, I certainly rang him. I, I'm not 100% whether well, I gave him the letter, but probably did. But I, yes. I, okay. Right. Senator you, Hanson, we're going to have to move yeah. to Senator you Henderson. Have, you have actually yes. stated that she was in her mental health was not the best. 
She was suicidal. She was not in the best of health. You receive a resignation letter from her that day and you just accept it. Where was your duty of care? And I'm talking to the board members. Where was your duty of care? You should not have accepted that resignation until you could have actually spoken to her to see about her mental health because it is not right to have accepted that. And you, and you say you care about her? You cared about her health? Where, where her mind was at? I, I was certainly aware in the immediate aftermath of the Senate, the 22nd of October, that she was under great stress. <coughs> I agree. Um, ten days later, uh, Christine sends us a resignated letter and, her and, and, a copy, and a copy of a statement she was going to make publicly at two o'clock in any event, any event. And it was a rational letter, a rational statement she was making that while we were very reluctant of the circumstances, we understood the circumstances. So between you getting the letter at 10.46 and you sending it to the Minister's office, did you have a meeting with the board uh, in that hour? Did you have a meeting? Did you discuss yeah. it with the board? Senator, yes, we did. We what, first of is all, that minuted? Yes, it is. Uh, we met at one o'clock. It takes a while to get everyone by contact, telephone, find a time yeah. that they're available, and we did. We met at one o'clock where we received, where we discussed the letter in question, we discussed the statement in question, and in fact, um, we then, I think- there, There's a break taken from at 1.35 about to 2.45. Mr Nutt and Ms West, you're actually um, legal eagles, aren't you? No. You know, the legal profession? You're not I'm a chartered accountant. Oh, I'm sorry, Will Mott. Yes. A humble arts graduate, Senator. Michael is a You've got the... Who's <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, where did you get the legal advice to accept this letter? Hold on. You don't need... A, if an employee comes along, whatever level they might be at, and they want to resign, you don't need legal advice to decide whether you take it up. Is it? That's what you've just asked. It's not under the contract, is it? Because under the contract, it says that six months' notice. That's right. And on we both have parties. So, okay. That's right. right. So, we're but we are retreading so we are old going water. Back on old ground. And I, I, we agreed to. As okay, order. Ms. Holgate wanted. Order. I'm going to go to Senator Henderson. You're right. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, look, I just to, look, we are obviously travelling a, a, over some ground that we covered um, when we last talk, spoke about this. <coughs> Two or three um, times. Ms Holgate has said that she was unlawfully stood down and that she did not resign. Uh, what do you say to that, just to try and sum up your position, okay. please? In terms of, the, first of all, the standing aside, I have clear views about what my discussions were and that she did stand aside. Clearly Christine Holgate is saying something different, uh, that she didn't stand aside. Mind you, that position didn't come through for Ms Holgate for some number of days after the, my facts were and on And you've the table. given evidence about the phone call at 6.38. And the phone calls, everything else. Sorry, just, no, you've given evidence about the phone call at 6.38pm on the 22nd of October when you spoke to her again. Again, yep. After the board meeting had concluded and she didn't raise any objection in relation right. to well, the standing side. Basically issue. it was informing her what we were going to do next in terms of sending out a press release, etc. And yep. can I also just refer you to the 7.20 email that went out that evening, which included a media statement? Correct. Uh, do you have a copy of that? Or are you I, don't, I don't have a copy, but... Well, in that, a media statement from... Just so this that is a clear. media statement from... Uh, um, that was a media statement, I believe, from the shareholder ministers. Was it? Uh, and that was sent out... That was sent <coughs> out to Ms Holgate, and that did refer to the chief executive standing aside? So the, there was a public statement from the chair at 7.40pm... Uh, regarding standing aside while the investigation was undertaken. Uh, that was emailed to Ms Holgate and her media advisor at 7.20pm. So, that so the public statement was made at 7.40? 7.40pm. And then the draft, well, that public statement was emailed in advance. Yes. And what could you read out what that said or the relevant part in relation to okay. standing aside? OK. So... This is a statement from you as from, chairman, from chair. representing the, the board. board. Yep. yep, correct. 
All right. An hour after, an hour, less than an hour after you you yeah. concluded yeah. your meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what that statement said was, the Australia Post board and management team will cooperate fully with the recently announced investigation to be conducted by shareholder departments. We remain committed to delivering for our, stake, our important stakeholders, our people, our post office partners, our customers and the community. Group CEO and Managing Director Christine Holgate will stand aside during the investigation. During this time, Rodney Boy's Chief Financial <coughs> Officer will be acting in the role. Okay, and so then the next morning at 6.27am, just to get the timeline correct, um, Ms Holgate sent an email to Australia Post executive team indicating, uh, thanking Rodney for agreeing to lead the team, uh, this and then indicating that um, can they please remain strong during um, to lead our ship through this. So during that period, I understand it was a very vexed couple of hours where Ms Holgate did not want to stand aside, but yeah. your view is, uh, Chairman, that eventually she did, and then that was reflected in, the, in, her, in her subsequent conduct. Correct. And, <coughs> and uh, what I was saying was there were a number of contacts, whether formally or informally, where her standing aside was accepted. Uh, the, the change in position of, from Ms Holgate as to whether she stood aside or didn't, in her case, uh, came some days later. Right. Yep. Um, can I just also ask you about... <coughs> sort of go into a different issue about the alternate delivery model which was adopted yes. um, when COVID first hit. Uh, and that involved a reduction of mail delivery services. Now, on the 8th of July last year, Ms Holgate told the Senate some of the support she was seeking would not have been temporary. And there was some reference, Senator Green was actually asking about a letter of the 31st of March 2020. Uh, and there was, I think, an indication that that would be tabled, that was taken on notice. And I don't believe it has been tabled. Uh, can you please explain what was in that letter and could we also have a copy of it, please? This is the 30th of the March. The 31st now. of March, 2020. That was a so, letter from Christine yeah. to the shareholder. That's right. Perhaps mm. if I can comment on yeah. that. Um, uh, as I understand it, a claim for public interest immunity has been made in respect of that letter. Uh, so uh, I don't think we're in a position to produce it or to talk to its contents. Who made that claim? I'm not aware of that claim. I think it was made by the Department of Finance. All right, can you, can you oh, check that? I can clarify that, yeah. Um, was that made on the day? Uh, subsequently, yeah. All right, if you uh, could... Yep, yeah, sorry, I've got confirmation. It was Minister for Finance. Uh, the claim was made 20th of July, 2020. Right, okay. Um, So, so I just want to ask about the, the, the mediation. Ms Holgate has said that she, when she resigned that she would not be seeking any financial Was payment. Was not seeking. Um, has her position changed? Um, given that we don't know what the claims are against us yet in detail, uh, I, I guess we can't be definitive, but it would appear to be so given that they are looking for mediation uh, as a prelude to potential litigation after. Do you understand the, the quantum of monies that you might be seeing? None of those details. Okay. And, and that's why, we, you know, I know they, they wanted us to start mediating last, last week. Um, we didn't because none of those details are on the table. We've got no idea what we're actually going to be mediating on. We're happy to go through the process and, and no, get I understand to the that. point. I think they want um, some time frames so it doesn't just get kicked down uh, that's, the road. That's fine. I agree with that. But I don't think the time frame we're talking about or what no, no, they asked for was reasonable. I suspect that's, you know, yeah. based uh, on your evidence, based on this, you know, maybe you just need to pick up the phone and sort it out. Can Senator I just, uh, just ask you about the Bank at Post deal? This yes. has obviously been a very positive deal for licensed post office yep. licensees and, and for rural and regional communities. It has been. Um, which executive led this deal and who sort of initiated and drove it? Because it, there seems to be a suggestion that Ms Holgate was very much at the forefront um, as the managing director. but. Who, who were those executives who led the charge on that deal? And secondly, was that a deal uh, endorsed by the board, discussed by the board, and signed off by the board? 
Um, so I'll answer this question mm -hmm. to the extent I can. I wasn't the chair at the time of the deal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, cer no. but certainly, um, we do in my have the, lengthy the next discussion chair coming straight up. Sure. After yeah, that's so. fine. In, in my lengthy discussions with Christine, as part of my induction, <laughs> uh, she spoke at length about this great deal they had done. It was the very first meeting I had with her, and there's no doubt the way she presented it to me, she was very much behind this deal, uh, involved in this deal, and it was very much her, her, her mm -hmm. idea. Now, the, obviously, there were others who would have dealt with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks, Senator. Um, uh, sorry, but just, Mr. Uh, just from the... wants to contribute something. Yeah, thanks very much, <coughs> Chair. Um, Michael Robinson, non-executive director, Australia Post. Uh, just to answer the question from uh, Senator uh, McKenzie before, uh, we were absolutely, totally, and are still behind the bank at post. It has Thank provided you. us with an enormous amount of revenue. We've been able to distribute that effectively uh, to the LPOs. Uh, a lot of these LPOs, Senators, as I know you are aware, and Senator Henderson will be aware, are very small family right. operations. And they have struggled, they struggle with the technology, they struggle with a whole range of things. And what the bank at post enabled us to do was to provide them with financial and other uh, support. And the board is very proud of what we did, <coughs> and we are fully committed. Uh, Senator, I think if I could <coughs> ask a favour of you, uh, is that Christine did a fantastic job, and this is to ask <coughs> Senator Henderson's uh, question, Christine did a fantastic job dealing directly uh, with the managing directors and CEOs of the three major banks. The only one we couldn't get, uh, which I think was a matter of great disappointment, was the ANZ. ANZ. Uh, we are still working on that. Uh, our executives are in discussions with the organisations. I gather it's going reasonably uh, well, but it, it happens with the full imprimatur of the board. We want this renewed and we want ANZ on board. And so, I think, I Mr. Ronald, also, sorry, hang sorry, on, Chair, Senator, I have the no, but no, I, I have the call. Was actually I have, my I have the call, time. Chair. Could I just continue my no, questions? I think Senator Order. Order. Yeah, I understand that, but I have the call. If I could no, just continue. No, no, so, McKenzie so, um, Mr. Ronaldson, this no, was very no. much a deal embraced by, supported by, and signed off by the board. Absolutely, and 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 Christine drove this. She told us what she was going to do. We said absolutely go for it. And I tell you, we were, uh, without being silly about it, we were actually really excited when she nailed this deal. Because we knew what it meant to the organisation. Our only disappointment was the other major didn't. But there's now 80 odd organisations from recollection who are involved in Bank at Post. There's, there's minor financial institutions. It is a fantastic initiative and quite frankly as how I many all represent um, you know, your states you'll be acutely aware of this this is a really really important thing for re regional and rural communities and as the banks pull out uh, we are filling yeah. that space and we want to expand that and extend it not in any way reduce it yeah, I was just, just, just going to add Chair, it. I as as more bank Closures, branch closures occur, this becomes ever more critical. Maybe not. I know Senator Henderson raised this about the deal last week about the $4.50 charge. Yeah, that was something that I did raise a concern about. It, it, uh, it's, I'm, I'm advised that the transaction fee per transaction is $4.50. Uh, so that would be wonderful for that to be looked at, Mr. Chairman, if I can say. Uh, because when we talk about look, um, standing up for rural and regional communities, we want equity right across the board. So I yeah, think yeah. The, other, yeah, yeah. I understand. Are, the other okay. side of the coin, of course, is that that's also a vital piece of revenue for those LPOs. Well, but so we, want to see to look at both we, sides. we do want to see equity in rural and uh, regional Senator communities, so, so that would be wonderful. Miranda Chair, look, I might come back to... Um, Chair, I might come back to more questions, but I'll hand over to others okay. now. For Chair, the Senator... Sorry, sorry if I may. Does Senator Henderson um, ask some questions about Christine's uh, resignation? Can, can I refer the committee to page um, 83 of Christine's 
submission. We already have that as evidence, Mr. Ronald. Yeah, well, can so I, can I, we have. We are noting it, and we're short of time. Okay, so you, you well, do well, have no, notice of Mr. It. Bellings. But I, I, I'd be happy I, to, um, if Mr. Ronald's no, agreed. Sorry, that. We're, we're very short yeah, on time. Just, uh, two, two seconds, anyone, Chair. Yeah. I actually uh, specifically asked uh, the company secretary and council whether. Uh, Mr. Drury had heard from Mr. Uh, Belling in any way withdrawing the matters in that letter, and the advice I've received back is that it has not. Thank you. Okay. Senator Carr. Oh, Senator Thank Carr. Thank you very much. Dear Thank you very much. Uh, look, uh, given the time, I, I really uh, would ask the board to take this on notice. There's been a number of statements and repeated today by the chairman that the board at no time discussed privatisation. I'd like you to uh, reconcile that statement with the position uh, that's been put by the Boston Consulting Group at the meeting on the 20th. And Mr Chairman, I add this point, you've said in previous time there were no recommendations. Page 10 of the Boston Consulting Group contains the word recommendations on several points. I'd ask you to reconcile your evidence with that uh, statement on page 10. Uh, and in addition, the statements where it says, if the government decides to further investigate potential full or partial divestiture of parcel business, I want to take a detailed scoping study. And further, at, on the same page, to take a range of steps to optimise Australia's capital structure, including exploring potential divestitures of specific sub Sigeries, including Star Trek, Road Express and Secure Pay. If the board did not discuss those matters, what were you doing during that one and a half present hour <coughs> presentation by the Boston Consulting Group? And furthermore, in the report that was presented by the Boston Consulting Group uh, in their overhead slides, which indicated uh, on the uh, summary statement where the specific reference once again was to explore the potential for the divestiture of parcels, which included that would leave a loss making core business without a meaningful reforms to letters. But I'd ask the chairman of the board uh, if you could reconcile that evidence with the documentary evidence that's been presented to us. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair. Can I have the call for a quick yes, set of questions? Can I ask perishable call questions? Mr. MacGyver? Say ciao to Mr Macdonald. <laughs> Call a great champion for rural and regional Australia to... Yeah. There we go. Um, now, gentlemen, um, just following up on Senator Carr's line of questioning, and I know at our last meeting every single one of you, uh, I think Mr Nutt, you weren't, but you reiterated today, uh, the privatisation of Australia Post or any of its um, subset businesses is not something any of you as board members uh, will be entertaining. I guess the, the semantic debate we're having today, uh, having got the BCG PowerPoint you all um, discussed, was isn't, um, isn't divestiture simply the rich man's privatisation? <clears throat> if I maybe could start off, um, yeah, I, you know, it's part privatisation, if yeah. that's the word you want to put to it. Uh, however, they were BCG's pathways, whatever they call them, and whatever recommendations they did or didn't make. But we didn't discuss it. It wasn't for us to argue whether the the shareholders consultants were on the right track or not the right track. They were things that they would put forward. You were being informed. They were being, we were being informed and we were so informed. But it wasn't our report. It wasn't any action we we're going to take. It wasn't. And the fact that it subsequently has remained. Mm. Well, COVID um, sort of. Yeah. I, I guess um, my we, question is, oh, sorry, sorry. That, no, that you've answered the okay, question. Thank you. Um, so then the reality is, if the shareholder ministers chose to um, implement one of those reform mechanisms or, or strategies, is there anything that you as the board of Australia Post, who are intimately um, au fait with the operating of the organisation and care deeply about its ongoing financial sustainability, was there any mechanism for you as the Australia Post board 
uh, to reject or um, say, no thanks, thanks Minister, but we've got other plans? Look, the reality is you're coming up with a hypothetical if No, no, if, I'm not actually. If they I'm do not this. actually. Okay. This isn't a hypothetical. What regulatory framework or um, legislative mechanisms do you have at your um, at your uh, availability if a shareholder minister had have chosen one of those? It's not hypothetical because this could have happened. It's only that COVID took over. I, look, I, I'll put it in general terms. I'll answer it in general do terms. Do you have the power to say no? No, thanks. No, no, I'm just no, no. asking the no, board. No. First, Mr. Bartolomeo, can please, I, I'm can asking. Can I answer? The I'd like to answer. <laughs> Sorry, Senator. Uh, look, I've I've worked in GBEs or state-owned corporations virtually my whole career, um, and the, the the kind of line that I've always worked to is I always give my shareholders the best advice I can give with my professional so knowledge. So you can't say no. There is no power for you. To, if they uh, no, no. If if that if they ask that question with a direction, in other words, it's a formal ask, yeah. then we can't say no. Yeah. Okay. That's right. But, but if it's not, and it's really teasing potential directions, we give our best advice. The yep. board will always give its best advice. So one of the um, issues I was pursuing on the back of the fabulous ABC story around um, your decision as an organisation to cancel. Um, perishable good postage. Um, Mr. Boyce gave some really interesting evidence, which I, I really, you know, food safety regulation. Um, there's seven different versions across this great federation. He, his evidence to us was that um, it's really complex. And I actually, la 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 la, actually went through it and said, so you actually did not know that there were seven different food safety regulatory environments that you had to post across prior to getting a report, which apparently is a KPMG report. Is that correct? I'm not aware of that. Anyone aware of this? So um, was the decision to stop delivering perishable goods a decision of the board? No. No. It did not come to the board. Okay. So the board didn't commission the KPMG report? <coughs> which is Mr. Boys has referred to as being. I, I'm not aware. Okay, not aware. so on notice Senator then. Kinsley. On notice, I'd like the terms of reference of this KPMG report. I'd like the, uh, you to table the report. I want to know when it was commissioned. I want to know how much it cost, and I want to understand the recommendations that see um, Australia Post cancelling the um, postage of perishable goods. Um, and then, obviously, backflipping within a chair, matter of weeks. Uh, sorry, um, chair, chair three, Senator. Um, I think when the board, um, and I speak for myself, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure I speak for others, but when the board became aware of um, this issue, uh, concerns uh, were raised, and I'm sure they were raised by many of my colleagues um, as well, because it was, in fairness, uh, out of left field. Yes. Now, uh, I, am, I am confident, uh, and you know the gentleman as well as I do, um, uh, Bruce Bilson, that I am confident the discussions with Bruce, uh, that it will elevate the status of, of, of this, and I would hope that we have some uh, resolution. But I can assure you uh, the board did not make a decision uh, to do that. And you weren't aware and that we this weren't was aware okay. and, and we have moved, and I'm not reflecting at all on what was done, I'm reflecting on what has happened since. Uh, and I think thank, we are fair to say we are now fully engaged. Thank in this you, Mr. Discussion. Ronaldson. Thanks. And uh, there's some questions on notice from Senator McKenzie. I just really uh, want to finish this by half past. Um, Senator Henderson, you've got four minutes. Oh, yes, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Look, I just um, wanted to go back to this issue of the BCG recommendations and the regulatory relief which was put in place, which of course involves a reduction in daily mail services in metro areas and in some regional areas. 
so that you could boost the number of parcels being delivered by reason of the pressures that you were under because of the COVID. So Ms Holgate has said on the 13th of April that um, she objected rigorously to the BCG recommendations, which do include alternate, some of them do include alternate mail delivery. Um, but we, we obviously now know that she actually uh, did appeal in the Senate, uh, did appeal for the regulatory relief to be adopted, which obviously involved a reduction in mail services. So how can we reconcile those two positions which have, because of course the regu regulatory relief was very, very similar to some of the recommendations made by BCG. Um, well, from my perspective, and I think the board's perspective is, BCG to us was a one and a half hour presentation by a consultant that we hadn't engaged to a terms of reference that we were vaguely aware of, but operating for, for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. We took that, in, uh, that session as an information session, no more, no less. Um, and the details then of what was occurring during COVID and the impact it was having on us led us quite separately, independent of whatever BCG had said, good, bad or indifferent, mm. as to how we were going to deal with the circumstances that we were facing. And in Christine, uh, obviously at the, sorry, Miss Holgate, at, at the, the heart of this was developing with her team uh, a number of measures that that uh, she wished us to consider as a board, and we did, uh, ultimately seeking temporary regulatory relief along the lines that, that you're aware of. And the so-called parcel boost initiative. Uh, all, in about, yeah. all about getting resources to where we desperately needed them, i.e. in the metropolitan area, some 2,000 postal delivery officers were taken off their bikes and put into a van to help delivery of those parcels. And we were able to do that by going to alternate day delivery. So effectively half the postal officers, postal delivery posties uh, in the metropolitan area were diverted to delivering parcels in vans. And it got us through this really terrible period. Did and Ms. successfully Hol so. Did Ms Holgate ever suggest to you that some of these measures should be imposed on a permanent basis? Uh, such, was, as, such as the alternate mail delivery? It wasn't discussed as a, as, as a long term. In my own opening statement today, I'm saying I don't think the regulatory arrangements as we have today is what's best for Australia Post going forward, but some change is required. And we're in the midst of very significant discussions with all our folk, including the unions, in fact that some of them were occurring today, about what that would, would look like. Mm -hmm. And so I... I can't recall whether Ms Holgate was thinking of the TRR as a long term. It was very much requested as temporary but regulatory. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Hanson, you had a follow up? No? You were... Well, I just want to know are you going to have the Isaac Awards next year? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Are you Look, budgeting for that, the half a million dollars, under public expectation? We will look at the, the rewards and what we spent. I have no idea what we spent uh, in any detail, but clearly they, are, we have, they have been deemed, and I see no reason to change, as very significant functions to recognise the reward of not just a couple of senior executives, but thousands of employees across the board. OK, thank you, and uh, thank you, uh members of the board and so, chairman. Sir, sorry, Chair, before we finish, um, I don't take up any time. I don't want to inflame anything. But I think in fairness, uh, in a uh, frenzied uh, opening to this, um, uh, Senator Kitching made some uh, comments. Mr that, Ronson, uh, are you seeking, yeah, uh, and I, and seeking I, to I haven't respond? Even, I haven't even been given uh, the opportunity to see the statement. But, I'm a big boy. I, 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 hang I, I, on, I, hang on. Let him. Let let him. Thank you. Just be, can I just be clear, Mr. Ronison? Yeah. You're seeking a, a right of reply. Well, I, I'm, and I, I'm not going to drag it out, um, Senator. But just, just, just quickly. Look, clearly, um, I got under Senator Kitchen's skin uh, last week. Uh, she, as you okay. know, okay. Okay. as you know, um, uh, she's not uh, 
experienced and she hasn't got the scar tissue I've got in my back. I understand that. But can I can I make it can I make it absolute can, can I can I make it chair and I don't want to drag this out. Can I make it absolutely clear uh, that yes I yes I did share a house with Senator Birmingham. Uh, I haven't spoken to Simon for uh, six or eight months. I think he's still cross with me because I didn't wash a lot of dishes when we uh, were there. But uh, putting that to one side, I have not I have not received any speaking notes. Uh, from anyone in relation to this issue. Uh, I have... I, I, you are an independent I, 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 OK, let the witness I, speak. <laughs> let Chair, the witness speak. <laughs> Chair, uh, it's a long, long time uh, since I've received um, uh, Liberal Party speaking notes, I'm sure. And, and more often... Uh, OK, Mr... I used to change Mr. them Mr. most Robinson, of the time. Mr Robson, we are but, uh, really tight on time. So, 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 either so you Chair, can take this opportunity yeah. to have a fulsome response or you can take it on notice. Well, uh, the only way of doing that is through the privilege. I, I don't want to go through that. OK. But, but it was um, a fairly gratuitous attack. I'm a big boy. I'm happy. But I had no speaking notes. I uh, wasn't given any writing instructions. I did think that it was uh, t those gifts were totally uh, inappropriate. So if I just want to clear the public record there, Chair, and I, I'm mindful of your uh, request last week that we maintain some decency, uh, I will do that from uh, my part, but I think uh, out of respect I should have perhaps been given a little more time to, to respond. But look, that's, that's all I need to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr Robinson. Uh, thank you uh, to all of the members of the board and to the chairman. I appreciate your time and appearance once again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Thank now, we're just going to take a very short suspension before we have uh, Mr Stanhope with us uh, for a very quick private meeting. Uh, Chair, just on for the record, <coughs> I'm... Attend the rest of the yeah. We get... Yes. Okay. Okay, that's fine.
Thank you. So we will resume to uh, the end of our session today. Our final witness uh, is the former chair of Australia Post, Mr John Stanhope, appearing via video conference, although we can't see, see you, we can hear you. Um, Mr Stanhope, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could I please get you to state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, my name is John Stanhope and I'm appearing as a former chair of Australian Post. I served from the 22nd of November 2012 until the 21st of November 2019. Thank you. Now, I understand that um, you don't have a short opening statement and you're happy just to take questions, which I think will help us um, move through this a bit uh, speedier. Could I just ask you, though, um, what were the dates that you were the chair of Australia Post? Yeah, so from the 22nd of November 2012 to the 21st of November 2019, I served two terms, the first of four, and the second of three, so year, seven years all, all up. Seven years all up. Thank you so much. Um, and I will go to Senator Kitching. Just, sorry, just for um, uh, out of courtesy, Mr Stanhope, I'll just let you know that in the room here, we have myself, Senator Hanson-Young, uh, Senator Henderson uh, and uh, Senator Kitching. So thank you to Senator Kitching. Mr Stanhope, thank you for your time. Could I, could I ask you, um, Ms Holgate has said in evidence that there was a card that was signed... Oh, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can, oh, yeah. thank you. Um, that there was a card that went with the watches that was signed and you signed it. And I'm just yes. wondering if you could elaborate on that or give us the, you know, flesh out those circumstances. Yeah, sure. Thank so, you. so, so um, I was very involved, uh, as you would expect, on the, on the board uh, with the Bank of Post, and it was, as you've heard many times already, it was a very important uh, deal for the post offices, for the community of Australia, and uh, there were four executives who were involved, including. Uh, Ms. Polgate in uh, achieving that uh, arrangement. And um, I had put in front of me, by my own executive assistant actually, uh, four cards to sign uh, to thank uh, those people for their exceptional uh, effort in having uh, done that or achieved uh, that arrangement with the banks. Uh, at that time, I should point out, um, at that time, I did not know what the gift was, but I hastened to add Senator Fitching uh, that I supported them being recognised and rewarded. Right, but you didn't know they were watches? No, the choice, the choice uh, of reward was left by, by me uh, to uh, the CEO to uh, for at her discretion. At her discretion. Right. So there was no, there. You didn't apply a monetary limit. No. Uh, she had a delegation uh, that she was able to exercise. So uh, there was no monetary uh, limit put on that. Do you remember? Uh, she already had. She, she had a. She had a uh, a delegation limit. That, Placed on her, but not specifically so, for those. So, sorry, Mr. Issues. Stanhope, what was that? It was based on her what? Uh, her delegation of authority. Right. Right. And and uh, do you have? Do you remember what that amount was? Oh, I think she had a. I think it was a fairly large amount, like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for expenses. Uh, whether there was a specific amount for gifts, I can't recall. Right. But, but but certainly the money she spent per person was within uh, her delegation. Mm. But you didn't know, you only found that out last year, last October. Ah uh, yes, yes. Well, so you I had no, you, you had Sorry. no prior knowledge. No. So when I signed the cards, I asked, I asked specifically just to test my memory, 
because my memory was that I didn't see any gifts at the time of signing her card. And I asked my executive assistant, um, did anybody bring the gifts into my room when I signed those cards? And she confirmed my recollection, but that was not the case. So, so you asked you asked your executive, your former executive assistant, on the day yes. of estimates, when Ms. Holgate gave that evidence. Uh, I, I asked her. Might not have been that. No, not that day. Right, I okay. asked her when I, when I uh, was told there was a departmental uh, investigation, and that I would be invited to participate. Can I ask you, so who approved, when you were chair, did you approve the CEO's expenses? No, I did not. So that, it was the CF, <laughs> it was the CFO at that point as well? Now, I think uh, my recollection, Senator, is that when I started, uh, the company secretary uh, approved the CEO's uh, expenses and then it moved to the CFO. Um, I've, I've, look, I've been on boards for 30 years in various places and I'm all, being an ex Telstra person for a long time, I'm very familiar with GBE. When I arrived, it was unusual um, that yes. I didn't approve a CEO's expenses and I asked the question, as you might, you would hope I, I did. I, I, find, I find it unusual as well, Mr Stanhope, and I'm not sure yes. how it devolved. My understanding is that when Mr Mortimer was chair, that Mr Mortimer, yes. as chair, approved the CEO's expenses. Oh, is that right? Well, when I arrived, uh, that wasn't happening. And Can I? So, so I asked the question. I was told by the then company secretary because I wasn't a technically an employer, employee, I couldn't. So I accepted that. I, I recall on another occasion when it moved across to the CFO from the company secretary asking the same question and getting the same answer. I, uh, I asked when I went, before I participated in the departmental inquiry, I asked again the question, where is the documentary evidence to to suggest what I was told was correct? So, and, and it was not forthcoming. Well, I mean, well, it obviously devolved into quite a cosy relationship with the CEO approving the CFO's expenses and vice versa. I mean, I'm... Well, you, know, you would hope that wasn't the case and you would hope that you could trust your CEO to spend according to the delegations, but, but you know, there is an internal audit function in most companies. Well, I was going to ask you about that, and I have asked the board who were here with us earlier. The internal, uh, is, did, in your time as chair, did the internal audit person, did the internal audit report report to you as chair? No, never to me as chair, but there is a reporting uh, line to the chair of the audit committee. Yes. Okay. And, and, I, and yes, and and uh, uh, the board. Oh, well, sorry, I should say the audit committee would see the program of audits that would be conducted through a year. Right? Mm. And, and I'm sure there would have been audits, uh, if I recall. There were audit, audits of expenses and so on. Mm. So, did you check Mr. Fahor's expenses? I, I did not uh, sign off for Mr. As I said, as yes. chair, I was approving any CEO's you know, expenses, which I found unusual. But, you know. um, can I ask you, did, what was Mr. Fahor's delegation? I think it was the same. Um, uh, 150. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'd have to check. I, I mean, you can check that, but I'm pretty sure it didn't change uh, from one CEO to the other. Right. Um, could, are you able to give us any dates of um, when it moved from the, the approval mechanism moved from the company secretary to the CFO? Uh, look, no, sorry, I can't. Even but a that, vague, that, even a vague oh. recollection. 
I, I, look, I think it may have changed, and you'll you'll have to check this for fact, whether it's fact or not. But my recollection is it might have been around the time that the, 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 Chris, the Miss Holgate started. Sorry, Miss Holgate started. When started. She started. Um, as chair, how often did you meet with the CEO? Oh, I would, I would meet with the CEO probably at least fortnightly. Right, okay. Uh, we had conversations by phone as well. Um, uh, so we had regular catch ups, yeah. Okay. Um, Senator yes, Senator I'm, Henderson I, has some Thank you very much, Mr. Stanhope. You're thank, welcome. You, thank you, Mr. Stanhope. I'm going to take you now to Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Stanhope, thank you for your time and evidence uh, almost this evening. Um, in uh, Ms Holgate's submission to this inquiry, she said she spoke to you on the <laughs> afternoon of the estimates hearing. Uh, what did you discuss? Um, well, Senator Henderson, my phone started running hot with journalists. Um, and. Uh, they were starting. They were asking me some questions, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, this is two years on from when I was there, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? So, <laughs> I rang Christy, and and I asked, what what, what is going on, Christy? And she said, oh, I've just been to send an estimate. So there was this question, and and so on. I can't talk. I'm about to get into a car, and that was about the conversation. Sorry, I just missed that last. It's just a, the audio is a little bit tricky. Oh, what was sorry. the last part of your sentence? Oh, she said, she, she, I said, what's going on? Because I was getting all these phone calls. And she said, um, look, I can't really talk. Um, I've just come from Senate Estimates. I'm, I'm about to get into a car. Right. So. Oh. Did, did you have any other discussion or did you terminate the phone call at that point? No, she said, I'm getting in a car, I can't talk. I did try to contact Miss Holgate a couple of days later because there was a whole lot of press and so on that was occurring, but she wasn't answering her phone. So I was ringing to find out if she was all right. Um, all right, thank you. In the Maddox review, um, finding eight says that there is contradictory evidence as to whether the former group CEO and managing director informed the former chair that it was her intention to purchase the Cartier watches uh, or whether the former chair approved the commitment of funds for this purchase. No definitive finding can be made in this regard. I understand you've addressed some of these questions with Senator Kitching, but could you um, succinctly um, respond to that okay. suggestion uh, that you approve the purchase of these watches? Well, I certainly didn't approve the purchase of the watches. And where, where we disagree, and that's why they couldn't find, uh, they found how they, they did in the report was because uh, I know, I did not know that they were watches until the Senate Estimates hearing, and she believes that she told me. So we have a difference of view. Um, but let, let me say it, it again. I supported these people getting a reward and recognition for what they'd done. Uh, and, the, and and she said she chose the watches. She, she made the decision to, to choose what the reward was. I did not know, and, and I, it was also said that I attended a presentation. Again, my recollection was I didn't. I checked again with my diary and my executive assistant, and I, it, it appears I did not. So, um, so we have... See, we have a disagreement, if you like, as to whether she told me she was going to get watches. I say I didn't know. She says, I think I told him. So Ms Holgate, in her submission, makes it very clear, in, in her view, that you did approve the purchase of these watches. Um, and she says it almost defies credibility, given you signed the card 
and attended the meeting where the watches were presented. And she says, why would someone write in a card and not know what the gift was? What's your response to this? Well, my response to that is, I knew they were getting a gift. I did not know what it was. And if you read the words in the card, I don't talk about a gift at all. But I say, job well done, uh, and sign it. Which, you know, it's something, a good, a good thing for achievement to do for people who have done a good job. So why would Miss Holgate so adamantly say in her evidence that you did approve these watches? You can only ask her that. I mean, I, I'm adamant that I did not. So, Mr. Stanhope, so sorry, Holgate, Chair. I do have the call. Cop, I do have the call. Um, sorry, sorry, I have the call, Chair. Could I? Mr. I've just Stanhope, got some more questions. Ms. Holgate, Senator, Senator Kitching, Senator, Senator Kitching, you will just have to wait your turn. You will just. Senator thank you. Didn't wait this morning. Right. Um, no, I know, but two wrongs don't make a right, Senator thank, Henderson. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Stanhope, wrong, did you um, receive any gifts from Australia Post in your time as Chair? When I retired, I received a Mont Blanc uh, pen, which I understand the board approved. It's gift to me. Oh, so that was approved by the board, was it? Do you, do you know what the value was of that pen? Uh, it's probably worth a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, thank you. Ms Holgate claims in her submission that under the previous CEO, it had come to light cars, watches and trips to the Olympics were given. When asked about this on, at the 13th of April hearing, uh, Post conducted an internal review and responded to the question on notice and it said the review has not identified the provision of significant non-financial incentives given by or to Mr Fahua or senior executives employed during his tenure and on that basis has not indicated the provision of significant non-financial incentives being a business as usual practice. Um, would you agree with that? And what would be your response to Ms Holgate's claims? I don't believe there are any um, gifts or, you know, I mean, it's beyond my comprehension that somebody would be gifted a car, but, but, but you know, uh, I, I have no, knowledge of any such gifts. Now, when I arrived, um, and I, I arrived after the 2012 Olympics, I was aware that some people had attended the Olympics and that had, uh, was, but it was before my time because I do, and so how do I know? I do recall that Mr. Fahua uh, went to Senate Estimates and got questioned about it. Was there a, a culture of gift giving, a excessive gift giving when you were the chair of Australia Post? I would say not. All right, thank you very much, Mr Stanhope. No for the questions, thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Senator Henderson. Senator uh, Kitching, yes. Mr Stanhope, Ms Holgate also said in evidence that everyone on the 19th floor knew about the watches. It, no one tried to hide it because it was a proud moment because this deal was being done. Do you, did you never go to level 19? Yeah, I, I, I had an office on level 19. So no one ever mentioned, <laughs> no one ever mentioned <laughs> these watches to you? No, but everybody knew these people on the 19th floor that these people had done a good job and they were going to be recognised. So no one water. said, oh, look, wow, they got a Cartier watch or none of the four recipients ever showed you their watch for this um, amazing deal that was done? You know what? I do not remember even anybody showing me their watch. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stanhope. Appreciate you cooperating with our um, rearrangement of the time for your evidence. Thank you. You're welcome, Chair, and I'm sorry you couldn't see me. No, no, that's fine. Thank you so much. That concludes today's proceedings. I'd like to thank all the witnesses who have given evidence to the committee, and uh, I'd like to thank Hansard and the Secretariat um, and Broadcasting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair.